Appeal 2041 Growth Allocation and Growth Management Regional Official Plan Amendment, Water and Wastewater Planning and Servicing Growth to 2041, Transportation Planning and Servicing Growth to 2041, and Financial Policy and Technical Inputs for 2041 Growth-Based Development Charges Bylaw Update. The reports and supporting materials are very lengthy, more than 530 pages. Given the importance of the issue and the length of the materials, they will be provided to Council tomorrow rather than next Thursday to allow you an extra week for review. The reports and materials will be distributed electronically using the usual electronic agenda delivery system. Those who receive printed copies of agendas will be receiving the five reports and the supporting materials via courier to your offices tomorrow. Next Thursday, the full agenda for the 26th meeting will be available electronically as per usual. And for those who receive printed copies of the agendas, you will only receive the balance of the agenda to your offices, but we will not be reproducing the growth reports that you're going to be receiving tomorrow. When you receive your printed copies tomorrow, that will be the only copy that you're provided. If you or your administrative staff require any assistance with printing materials or a portion of the materials, because you can, only, you can print just portions of the material, you do not, are not required to print the whole 500 pages, just contact me and we can assist so that they can get the portions printed that you'd like printed. Given the volume of materials for the meeting on the 26th, Paper copies of the full package will not be available on the day of the meeting. So please don't forget them if, if you get printed copies because they will not be, we will not have the ability to give, provide you printed copies on the 26th. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, Councillor Sato. Oh, oh Palashi, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Palashi. I don't. I haven't got it on my screen. So okay, okay. I, I Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, when will those be made uh, available to the public? Friday following when you get them electronically next Thursday. So they'll be getting them a week in advance, not okay. the two weeks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Thank you. Um, is it staff's intention to do a presentation on each of these because? Uh, uh, we can read all 500 pages, but there may be portions of it that staff want highlighted for us. Yes, there will be presentations on the 26th. Great, thank you. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Um, will the rest of the agenda be adjusted, given the fact that these are large reports and will probably require significant amount of time? Is the rest of the agenda going to be kept concise <laughs> so that we can get through it? The rest of the agenda is actually a fairly heavy agenda oh. for the for the 26th. Um, the budget starts the next week, so there are some items that need to be attended to before the budget starts. The the 26th is going to be a big day. Okay. So you'll be providing dinner that night, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't expect that. <laughs> oh, thank you. David, yeah. A lot of the 500 pages are background technical um, appendices charts numbers and, and so on so uh, you may you may feel as you go through it you don't have to read all 500 pages and you'll be able to hone in on the parts that um, are relevant uh, to you so although it sounds onerous you, I think you'll find it's quite manageable okay good stuff um, Councillor Parrish yeah, I was just going to give you a, a little hint that if it is a heavy agenda, that we really exercise a little discipline on delegations if we have any and presentations. And I'm also hoping we do that during budget. Some budgets go on for 90 minutes. Some presentations and others can get theirs done in 20. So I would hope that we tighten things up all the way through the 26th and into the budget. Understood. Thank you. Okay, we're, uh, this moves us to the consent agenda then. Um, so we'll go item by item. Uh, 7.1, consent. 7.2, consent. 7.3, uh, there's a presentation, so I'd say not consent. Uh, 7.4, consent. 7.5, Okay, that's not consent then. 
uh, 7.6. Consent, 7.7. .7. Consent. Consent, 7.8. Consent, 7.9. Consent, 7.9. Consent. Consent. Um, 9.1 is a presentation, so I'd say not consent. 9.2. Consent. 11.1. Uh, .1. Consent. Consent. Oh. oh. Okay, no, we'll hold that down. 11.2. Uh, consent. 12.1. Uh, yes. Yeah, we're holding it. Yeah, I said it would be held. Just one, unless you want two held. Okay. 12.1. Uh, consent. 12.2, consent. 13.1, uh, there's a presentation, so I say not consent. 13.2, uh, we'll hold it. 13.3, and we'll hold that down too. All right. So do I take a motion now? So uh, moved by Councillor Anika then, seconded by Councillor Groves that the following matters listed on the October 12, 2017 Regional Council agenda be approved under the consent agenda, which mean, and the others will be held. Um, so that's 7.1, 7.2, 7.4, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9, 7.10, 7.11, 7.12, 7.13, 7.14, 7.15, 7.16, 7.17, 7.18, 7.19, 7.20, 7.21, 7.22, 
Together with community partners, we are spreading the word that we all have to work together to keep children safe. So we want you to dress purple. On October 24th, our hashtag is I Break the Silence, and all of you have your beautiful shirts in front of you. I hope that you will wear them um, because it does take a, ch uh, a village. The Region of Peel is also demonstrating our support for um, this initiative by also illuminating purple lights on our headquarters at 7120 here on uh, here Ontario and 10 Peel Center Drive on um, October 24th. So feel free to demonstrate your support in any way you can, whether it's a fly purple suit, uh, your t-shirt, your lights, do whatever feels good, but demonstrate your support. There's a number of activities um, that we uh, will be involved in to promote Child Abuse Awareness Month. We're working with our school boards to share information um, with all children, teachers, principals, um, so that they can play their role and families. We're launching at a local school on October 17th to include uh, community partners so that they can get engaged. We're working with uh, Peel's child abuse review team to share information with key uh, partners such as education, health, um, and police services. We're also launching a media campaign with hashtag I Break the Silence. So again, feel free to tweet about that. Um, we have a full page article that will be released in local papers and we're working with local media to, pr to promote Child Abuse Awareness Month. Everyone has uh, received your shirt, as I said, and I hope that you will wear them. We thank you again for your consistent support, and we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you in future. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd stay in place, Councillor Moore. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I, uh, for my colleagues' information, I have the pleasure of sitting on the Peel Children's Aid Foundation. Uh, that raises money for many of the programs and supports for families that the Peel Children's Aid Society delivers. So I would be remiss if I didn't encourage my colleagues to, to really look at the Peel Children's Aid Foundation as another way to support the good work for, of Peel Children's Aid uh, in our community. You make a tremendous difference. I have firsthand knowledge. My granddaughter uh, was adopted from Peel Children's Aid when she was nine years old. So I know how you uh, support uh, the children and their families in a, unif re a unification environment, but I also know how you continue to support uh, the adoptive parents uh, once the, the children find their forever home. And so I want to thank you personally for the work that you do. I wore purple today. I'm getting a... <laughs> ahead of the game. Uh, I read it in the agenda and thought I had to wear purple today. So, um, But there's a story also for me behind the purple. My granddaughter uh, was nine when she was adopted and as part of the whole uh, introducing her to the family, uh, her favorite color was purple. It was not a color I wore very often, if at all. Uh, but for my very first meeting with my granddaughter, I went out to buy purple. And when I met her for the first time, and she said, oh, I love your sense of style. Purple is my favorite color. So uh, it's very appropriate and, and near and dear to my heart. So thank you. Uh, and it'll be my pleasure to wear the shirt on October the 24th. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, through the chair, I guess. I couldn't really follow up too much more uh, and add too much more, uh, Councillor Moore, but um, just certainly the, the work that you're doing in terms of outreach to sort of cultural groups, uh, especially the new diversity groups, because uh, you do find sometimes culturally um, there, there are certain, uh, I guess, social norms that we have here that in other countries, um, so some of that education and some of that cultural awareness and, and, and uh, even our laws are different than another. How do you go about because uh, I think that's an important component as well is to, you know, this on one end raises awareness and, and really brings up, but, you know, getting into some of the cultural groups, I think that sometimes um, that becomes a little tricky, doesn't it? Uh, and if you just speak to about some of the activities that you do. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we actually do a lot of work with, um, uh, with multicultural uh, communities. We actually have a community engagement team um, and in fact, I don't know whether the council knows, but we actually were asked by the ministry 
to take the lead with the Syrian refugee so that we could do the education with the Syrian refugee uh, community as well. Um, and uh, we're involved in many, many community partnerships and uh, ongoing work uh, with our community. It, it's actually, to be honest, one of our strengths that, uh, uh, and, and just so that the council knows, we haven't had a single Syrian uh, child or youth in care, and uh, we've worked very, very hard with, with all communities. Yeah. Thank you. Very and part of this outreach is really also about encouraging people to make the call um, if they have concerns yes. um, and worries so, and, and understanding that our focus is family unification rather than separating the family is, is a, a really important part of our message so that people understand that um, our focus really is keeping families together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sprovieri. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, it's alarming the number of incidences that uh, you, you um, have been reported. Um, have you, have you fi are you finding that uh, the, uh, I know the population is growing, but uh, are the incidents growing, outpacing the population growth, or is it, uh, or are these measures that are being put into place actually helping uh, to, uh, you know, help the situation? Um, there's a number of um, actually increasing referrals. Um, our highest <coughs> referral is actually domestic violence. 32, 35% of our referrals actually are domestic violence. And so what we're finding is that uh, um, <clears throat> in, in all of the communities, it's not one particular community, but certainly domestic violence is certainly on the rise. Uh, the second uh, highest uh, other referral is really physical abuse often. Um, certainly um, uh, where in fact there has been uh, some uh, smacking of children, etc. The duty to report is really important. Um, we try and do a lot of uh, prevention work. We would like to do more preventative and prevention work. Um, but uh, certainly the population growth is one, but I think also communities becoming more aware of safety and well-being of children. Um, we still think that 13,000 referrals a year out of a 1.4 million population is probably under-reporting, uh, but those two seems to be the highest <coughs> referrals for us. Mm. And through the chair, I know that um, I have grandchildren, and they, and they tell me that, uh, that actually they're they're taught in school that if there's anything happens uh, that they should be uh, calling and uh, reporting. Uh, and is that how you get most of your uh, complaints? Is actually the children calling in uh, about the abuse that's going on, or is it? Uh, how do you get? How do you get involved? Um, three of our highest referring agency is um, uh, school. Um, we have the highest number of referrals, obviously. Uh, teachers keeping an eye on children and youth. The second highest referral agency is the police, because obviously the police are out in the community right across the region. And of course, health, uh, particularly when uh, children are taken to hospital. So those are the three highest referring agencies. We, we do get neighbors, we do get community um, uh, uh, citizens report to us as well, but those are the three highest uh, agencies that refer to us. Thank you. Well, thank you for the good work you're doing. and. Uh, I'm sure a lot of children appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your presentation today. And um, certainly, I know on behalf of Regional Council, I want to thank you for all the good work that you do with, within the community and keeping families together and, and working with the children. Uh, it's much appreciated. I just wanted to make a suggestion. This is to my the, uh, Mississauga, the Mississauga councillors as I, uh, I know uh, the tower at City Hall in Mississauga, they have a technical capability of lighting it up. Um, I don't know what colors. <laughs> I think they have all the rainbow. Uh, so I, I was just going to suggest maybe you could take it back to staff to see if on the 24th they could light up the, the tower in yeah, Mississauga. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank right. you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank take you. care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this takes us to um, items related to enterprise programs and services. Uh, Councillor Fonseca, if you'd chair this section, please.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So we have 7.3, an overview and update on the status of reserves, and this is for information, and we have a presentation by Norman Lum, Director, Business and Financial Planning, and Andrew Farr, Executive Director, Water and Wastewater. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so Andrew and I are very happy to be here today to discuss Peel's utility rate capital reserves. Uh, we're going to be covering the status of the reserve, uh, some of the risks we're facing going forward, and some options to mitigate, mitigate these risks. Um, so each year, Council is presented with a report uh, that provides an update on the status of Peel's reserves. Uh, you'll recognize this graph that we've used it in prior years uh, to demonstrate the adequacy of the reserves. It looks at the capital requirements over a 20-year period and compares them uh, to the available balance we'll have uh, based on current reserve contribution levels. So looking at the left side of the graph, um, you'll see that based on uh, draft numbers for the 20-year period between 2018 and 2037, we're estimating a capital requirement of $5.6 billion. Um, so comparing it to um, where we're having our funding levels today, uh, we'll have three and a half million, uh, three and a half billion, sorry, in funding. And that leaves a gap of just over $2 billion for that 20-year period. Um, so without increasing it, uh, what we're really saying is the, we'll have a $2 billion shortfall for a 20-year period. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Andrew, who's going to provide more details about the capital requirement side. Thanks, Norm. So as you know, our program's anchored in asset levels of service, which derive from our corporate asset management program. These levels of service help us determine when assets need to be rehabilitated or replaced and help us prioritize those investments to meet the needs of the community. Uh, they're based on ba balancing many factors, financial, environmental risks, social risk, and reputational risk. Two straightforward examples uh, that I wanted to highlight today of uh, service levels, and we have many, are sewer surcharges and water main breaks. We aim to have zero sanitary sewer surcharges related to inflow and infiltration, insufficient capacity, or other factors. For water mains, we review break history, age, material construction, so that we can ensure we balance financial pressures against the needs of the community. We don't want to replace water mains early, uh, but we also don't want to um, increase the impacts of the community of additional breaks or unnecessary construction. So with these service levels in mind, we're always increasing our ability to take advantage of data and evidence versus theoretical lifespan. As Anthony Parente mentioned last council in his presentation on inflow and infiltration, He's done a lot of work on flow monitoring the system, allowing us to pinpoint areas where we're seeing a lot of inflow and infiltration, which is going to lead to a, a more robust program looking at what are the sewers we need to replace and rehab based on their service versus just their age. Uh, also, we're using leading edge technology, and we brought a report earlier this year, looking at real-time uh, in-pipe condition assessment for large transmission main and sub-transmission mains. This lets us look at the condition of these la large water mains, which are critical to our system, without taking them out of service until we determine we have a problem. Uh, all this data analysis ensures that going forward, our state of good repair program gets better each year based on evidence rather than theory. But this comes at a cost. As we gather more evidence for certain assets, like water mains, we can look at extending their life because rather than replacing them when they get to the theoretical end of their life, if we know their condition, we can hold off on replacing them until they start deteriorating. But on the flip side, as Anthony also mentioned, as we start to do more and more maintenance hole inspections, more and more sanitary trunk sewer inspections, we're finding that some of those that we need to rehabilitate are well before the end of their life. Um, he showed lots of pictures of joints leaking, of um, sewer surcharging during wet weather events. So that's going to drive our program up in the short term and the long term. And we also know uh, that climate change, uh, unrelated to inflow and infiltration, is going to continue to drive our program. Um, in the coming years, we're planning to make investments in um, greenhouse gas reduction uh, projects at our wastewater treatment plants, which do reduce our carbon footprint, but they also uh, have a payback in, uh, they produce energy, which reduces our operating costs. 
So you're going to be seeing a report later this month on some federal and provincial funding opportunities that we're looking into to help fund those projects. But again, Peel does have to make some investment. So we're also continuing to integrate our replacement program with uh, intensification growth programs. So um, this ensures we meet the, the needs of the current customers that we have, but also set ourselves up for future customers. Um, some examples of these integrated programs would be uh, some of the replacement work we're doing in the Mississauga City Center, uh, downtown Brampton, uh, southwest Mississauga, and uh, Aaron Mills and Eglinton area. And the last point I'd like to make is around stimulus funding programs. As you know, the region took advantage of a fairly significant investment by the provincial and federal government uh, last year and into this year. Um, we received over $130 million in funding, but we're responsible for, for coming up for part of that funding to be able to take advantage of that. So we need to be able to, to leverage that. We need money to be able to do that. So what are the risks of um, our current contribution levels? Um, I've covered, uh, Norm's already covered the status of a reserve and a little bit about what's driving our program, but uh, what would be the risks, again, of, of continuing it, continue, uh, these con contribution levels? Can't get that out. Um, as, as Norm mentioned, a reserve impact could impact our liability to leverage infrastructure programs. Um, we're, we see them uh, often. They don't come with a lot of notice, and we have to have projects ready to go. So we have to contribute funding both upfront for on design and also be ready to contribute our, whether it be 25%, 30%, whatever it is, to leverage other folks' money. And while we, we may be able to pro program an annual state of good repair program that meets the needs of the community, um, at this point in time and continue, we don't have a lot of buffer for the unknown. Um, if things were to come up operationally, large water main breaks that, that, that aren't in the couple thousand dollar range to fix that might be, uh, we often see ones that are hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair. Um, if those were to increase, we don't have a lot of money to change, to change lanes. Um, or if uh, we're doing condition assessment on large, large trunk sewers, um, if we do re recover one that is in terrible shape that we have to get back in service quickly, we may have to spend money that we don't necessarily have. And uh, this may, in the end, result in us having to update with you levels of service. And I'm not sure that's where we want to go. And finally, if we're not investing or able to invest um, in infrastructure, uh, we could run the risk of our infrastructure spending and our revenue uh, becoming too wide, which could impact our credit rating going forward. So I'd like to turn it back to Norm, who's got some options going forward. Thanks, Andrew. So some options for Council to consider to mitigate the risks and pressures that uh, Andrew had highlighted on the reserves would be to increase our reserve contributions. So if you're using a 3.5% increase uh, included in the overall utility rate, uh, that would take about eight years to close the reserve uh, gap. And at 5%, it'll take roughly uh, five years, and at 6.5%, 3.7 years. The impact of the average um, home uh, for each increase, so at 3.5%, is about a $22 increase for the resident. Uh, at 5%, it's $32, and that's on a 12-month uh, building cycle. And for 6.5%, about $40. And that's roughly, on the small business, uh, for 3.5%, it's $55. Uh, at 5%, it's $76, and at 6.5%, it's $96. Um, so we will be bringing back uh, a recommendation to Council through the 2018 budget, uh, taking into account the risks and pressures we've highlighted today. And that's actually the end of our short presentation, and we'd be happy to answer any questions the Council may have. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's anyone on the board. <coughs> Councillor Groves. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I just have a couple of quick questions. And one is, how did we end up with such a large gap? Because two point something billion is a huge gap. I'm sure. Um, when we are looking at our, our reserves and what we need to um, fund, a, much like our other assets in Peel, we're constantly doing um, assessments, technical assessments, to get a state of good repair. 
I mean, you've seen some of that in housing, you've, and as we go through it, uh, we update our information. And, you know, we used to use a 10-year cycle to look at the uh, capital assets. So when you're looking at a 10-year period compared to reserves, uh, the number is going to be smaller just by the fact that we're only looking at 10 years' worth of capital. And going to 20 years, which is probably a better way to look at it because it allows uh, more pre-planning, is a better way to look at it. Uh, I mean, if you look at it overall, $2 billion on 20 years, it's only about a, it's about $100 million. And our total assets at Peel, uh, tax and utility, are about $26 billion. Yeah, I guess just from a resident's perspective, when they look at this, they'll be going, oh, my God, two point whatever billion dollars that you're, you're short or are shortfall. So that would be because that's how they would look at it. Um, with respect to the increases, um, you're going to come back with a recommendation. But you know that every time there's an increase in anything, we hear from the residents. And, and so how would we um, educate the public, I guess, and how would you do that? on the reason for the increase and the, and the amount. Oh. So part of uh, the presentations you'll see on, on November 2nd uh, from the CFO will include, um, you know, how or why we need, we're make, making a recommendation on that increase and what it funds. Um, and part of it is probably more expanded reasons on what we presented today. Because uh, there's a big laundry list of things that we're trying to fund going forward. Right. And as Andrew had mentioned earlier, I mean, some of those things include maybe advancing capital forward or taking advantage of funding. You know, to a certain degree, uh, he had mentioned that in order to take advantage of funding from the province and the feds, you have to have something in there. So if we don't have it available to help match, then we can't take advantage of it either. Right. So we'll try and paint that picture as part of our presentation, both on, on the financial side, what it costs, but also what the tangible benefits will be. Right, and I think that would be really important yeah. so that this way residents can understand what those benefits are because if you're not going to be able to fund certain projects then of course we're also going to get those phone calls saying why isn't my um, project done and, and and that sort of stuff so I think it's important that we have something that we can explain to them as well when we get those phone calls this is why we're doing this this is why we need to do this um, and so would you say I guess I would I would say that the underfunding that we've been experiencing in Peel region is a contributor to where we are today and probably not just in this particular area but I'm, I'm sure in all the other areas that we we have to provide services would you say that that's part of the uh, yeah I mean it's not um, uh, the reserve shortfall or gap is not um, solely on utility rate reserves I mean you see it on tax and you probably experience the same thing at the local municipalities where you're experiencing some pressures on your reserves relative to your capital requirements. It's no different here. And as we get better information and we update it uh, along the way, then we kind of get a better picture. And like I said, we had mentioned earlier, we expanded our view to from 10 to 20 years to make it a better long-term look. The advantage of that is that if you can put reserves earlier, then you're really building up uh, longer as opposed to waiting until the 19th year of a 20th year, and then you're looking for a huge increase to fund it right away. Thank you. Well, I think we've done a pretty well done a pretty good job managing things over the years, but I guess things come up where you do need repairs and you need to spend the money. So anyway, I look forward to the report in November. Thank you. CFO would like to speak. Okay, thank you. Groves and um, David. Or sorry, Stephen, I thought you said David. <laughs> <laughs> There we go, sorry. Uh, through the chair, if I may, just add to that the province and federal government historically over the last 20, 30 years haven't really been in the infrastructure funding game, and I think that's where your question was going down the path. They are more recently providing some infrastructure funding. Um, I think Anthony alluded to it in his presentation. So we received about $103 million in water, wastewater funding. On a $2 billion shortfall, it's a very small amount. Uh, so we need longer-term, more sustainable funding from the province and federal governments to ease that burden. And as, that, as we get information on what that sustainable funding will look like, it may, it'll shave little pieces off of what we need to set aside, but we still need to set aside additional funds to manage our infrastructure risk. Thank you. So I just want to add to what Steve's saying. I don't 
think it is prudent for us to sit back and rely and to hope. Hope is never a great strategy. Um, to hope for the federal and provincial government to come in and give us infrastructure funding for the state of good repair on a $26 billion asset. We have to actively manage this ourselves, and that's really what this is about. This isn't about new projects. This is about putting money away now so that through the magic of compound interest, um, it builds and we have the money available for repairs when we need them. As Steve had said, if we do get infrastructure funding for state of good repair from the provincial and federal governments, that's great. It means that we can adjust how much we put away. But I would strongly recommend against solely relying on the largesse of other levels of government to make this work. Okay, thank you. And as far as the federal and provincial government, there's, you mentioned that it's a, a call, like that we would, within the presentation, you would show how we would match it, but is there not, depending on the pot of funding, not relying on federal or provincial nope. funding, but is there not um, funding that is being made available, especially with asset management and state of good repair, where the, the federal government will provide, say, 60 percent, and then that would go hand in hand with the province at, say, 30 percent, and then the municipalities or the region putting in, uh, what's the remainder of that, 20 percent? Yes. <laughs> so, so it's not always necessarily um, a matching? No, I mean, in the recent program with the Clean Water and Wastewater Funding Program, that specific program required us to contribute 30 percent. And it varies, yes, okay. uh, but that one had a 30 percent requirement for us to fund okay. with uh, the... Good. Okay, thank you. With regards to Councillor Grove's question about the education and awareness, we did recently raise the utility, um, the, the uh, rates on utilities, so to have um, have in the presentation, um, and, and Andrew, in your presentation, you talked and gave points about the risk analysis, but if you could show in terms of grass, yeah. grass um, risk tolerance or risk analysis, and also um, how we could um, explain another increase on the utility, I think that would be beneficial as well. Uh, Councillor Raz. Councillor Raz. Raz. Thank you, Madam Chair and Madam Clerk. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation today, uh, Norm and Andrew. Um, always good information. When, uh, do you think your zero goal for, was it uh, surcharging and, um, uh, is it, was it infill and infiltration? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a reasonable objective? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> That answers my question. I do appreciate the work that's going on with Lornwood Creek. We're replacing a sewer and they're actually using some innovative technology to rather than replace the whole sewer line, they're they're lining it. So I know as we move forward in this, there's other mm -hmm. creative and, and even cheaper technologies that we're using. Um, the, the utility rate uh, increase that you're suggesting, I think last year our rate was 5%. Is this an addition to that planned utility rate increase? So would it then be 8.5% for the? No, no. So last year's increase at 5%, 1.5% uh, was for operations and 3.5% was for uh, infrastructure. So any increase we'd have from operational pressures would be over and above the, um, these numbers. So it was 1.5 on 3.5 would be 5 again. Okay, so that's, we have to look at those, That and you're just on the capital side, correct? I'm only looking at the capital for right now. So those increases are, um, don't include the operating? No. Okay. Um, is that information going to come forward because the number is quite a bit, the increase that we're going to be facing would be quite a bit bigger? Uh, yeah, I mean, typically speaking, the operating increase is a lot smaller than the capital requirement. So. If you use last year's increase as an indicator, it was one and a half out of the five, or right. three and a half out of the five for the infrastructure increase. And those residents in Mississauga also have the storm water levy, which would presumably be increased uh, in the coming years as well. So um, when it, I guess the challenge with the utility rate increase is that as, uh, as the percentage uh, increases, people were, are going to be encouraged to save more so that uh, there's that inherent risk of if you increase it too much, people are going to be doing too good a job at conserving, and how do you still make up that existing gap? So right now, in um, we have about um, we have working fund reserves to help address annual pressure. So if you saw in any particular year where they use less water, we could still buffer using our uh, operating reserves. 
and then we'd make the adjustment in the following year for the reduced consumption. Do we have an infrastructure levy here at the Region of Peel? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and what is it? Is it one percent? Uh, on the tax side, it's one percent. On utility rate, it's the three uh, numbers that I we put up on the board today. Okay. All right. Uh, and just one side comment on this, the the public signs for those capital infrastructure projects. They're horrible. Uh, I've you, it, when you pass by it even you know 30 kilometers an hour you can't read them. I think someone got real creative and made them look pretty, but you can't read a darn thing on those signs. So I don't know. It, and we're we're the we're on the front lines because that has the mm -hmm. province, the feds, and, and Peel region, and we're the ones out there doing the work. So I'm just wondering if we can make an improvement in those signs because we're not getting point, any credit point. for what's being done, point and on. we can't understand yeah. what's being uh, said. So that was my two cents as okay. a frustrated resident. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Yannicka. Thank you. Um, I just want to underline the CAO's point. I think I've spoken to this before. I get very concerned when we talk about infrastructure <laughs> stimulus funding money for stuff that doesn't make a sexy election photo op, because that's what governs us with our provincial and federal friends. None of them's going to want to crawl down a sewer to give you a $2 million check. So if it isn't parks, if it isn't waterfront, et cetera, et cetera, we ain't getting that money. So a strategy, as you say, of hope that they're going to help us fund infrastructure that gets them no bang for the buck. Here, the bridge was falling apart. We redid the bridge. It was $100 million. Ain't sexy because people say, I drove on the bridge last week. I what did you really do for me? Did you get me something bright and shiny? So this is the worst segment of our budget if we're relying on provincial federal money because it's a loser to them and we ain't get, we'd better look after our own affairs <laughs> and hope the money keeps coming for the, the sexy stuff come an election time that makes for a good photo op because that's all that governs them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Yannicka. Any, anyone? Okay, and no one further. So I do know in the presentation coming forward during budget that there will be both short, shorter term and longer term yeah. look at this, which I think, uh, to David's point, very important, uh, how to best manage our infrastructure. And um, so you've taken the questions back that have come here in terms of the request and how the presentation is presented to Council. And Councillor Groves, would you like to move? This is uh, for information, so it's just moved by Councillor Groves, seconded by Councillor Yannicka. All in favor? Opposed, carried, thank you. <clears throat> and then moving on to 7.5, I believe, Councillor Ross, did you hold this one? Someone held 7.5, was I think Councillor Ross. <laughs> My, oh, there we go. Update uh, on the retention of an integrity commissioner and lobbyist. Uh, yes, I, one of my questions was now that he's um, uh, going to be on for the, the full term, are we going to expect an annual report at all at the, at the end of uh, his term? Yes, there will be an annual report from um, the integrity commissioner. His contract is until January. We're having an RFP right now for um, a longer term integrity commissioner lobby registrar and he is providing a report at the end of the year. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Very good question. Councillor Ross, would you like to move the report? Moved by Councillor Ross, seconded by Councillor Downey. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. That's great. And back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> brings us to uh, items related to public works. Uh, Councillor Starr, if you'd chair this section, please. The uh, first item is uh, 9.1, and uh, we are going to have a presentation on Peel Accessible Transportation Master Plan. This will be an update. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, sitting here beside me today is David Marjada, who is part of the TransHelp leadership team, and he's here to help me uh, to assist me today. The path that we are on. The Accessible Transportation Master Plan was adopted in 2012, and the reason why it was completed was twofold. One, to anticipate changes to AODA legislation, and two, to assess options through the current delivery model in response to those changes. Since 2012, we've had several presentations here at Council, to our advisory committees, to various members of the public, and stakeholders informing them of these changes. In 2016, Council adopted the revised eligibility policy which now includes residents with cognitive disabilities as opposed to limiting to those with only physical disabilities. And as of January 1st of this year, 
the new legislation became effective. We met all of our deadlines to ensure all of our practices and policies were AODA compliant. In the master plan, there were several objectives, but here today I'm only going to mention a few key ones for you. First, to understand the impact of AODA changes on the demand for our services and to understand and manage the complexity of our changing client needs. Secondly, to adopt the advanced brokerage model, which includes implementing a new performance management structure with our third-party contractors. And lastly, to develop a business intelligence capability to inform decision-making, to ensure that we continue to look at our operations to ensure they're efficient, and lastly, to look at, continuously look at various service delivery models to respond to changes in industry trends and technology. And you'll see throughout the presentation today that our progress to date is essentially on track to meet these objectives. As I mentioned a couple minutes ago, before the new legislation came into effect, only those with physical disabilities were eligible for trans help. And looking at the chart, you can see that shaded in the orange. But effective of January this year, also those, those people with cognitive, cognitive disabilities are eligible, eligible as well. As a result, we will expect to see the demand for trans help services increase over time. And in a few slides, I'll show you some early indicators that actually show you this. Most of you have seen this chart several times in the past. What it shows you is the anticipated trip volume before and after the master plan was implemented. And just for context for you, today in 2017, we expect to deliver about 650,000 trips. What you'll see in the chart is that without the master plan in place, and that's the red line up top, uh, our trip volumes will reach about 2 million trips by 2031. However, with the master plan in place, we can reduce that trip total by about 30 percent, or 600,000 trips, and that represents an annual savings of about $40 million by 2031. So as I mentioned to you before, our progress to date right now, essentially I think we're on track with what the master plan expected us to do. Our trip volume is in line with what was anticipated, and in a couple minutes on the next slide, I'll show you some specific numbers to show that. We've started to implement the advanced brokerage model, which probably has to do, again, with altering the pricing and performance management of our third-party vendors, and we implemented that in 2016. We're continuing our partnership with local municipalities to integrate our trans help services with conventional transit. Our conventional partners, both in the city of Mississauga and Brampton, have made significant investments in recent years, which should help make the transit experience easier for our clients. That includes having low-floor buses, priority seating, uh, advanced stop announcements, just to name a few. We're continuing this long journey of integrating our services with, with conventional, as we're starting to plan now for other initiatives, such as passenger travel training and fare, fare integration, just to name a couple. And looking at the last uh, point on the slide, as our trip growth is in line with the master plan, as so is our FTE growth as well. <coughs> on this slide, you'll actually see how our trip growth is actually fair to, or compared to our master plan. When you look at 2014 to 2017, essentially you'll see is that our, our trip growth on each one of those four years has been aligned with what was adopted in the master plan. So for 2018 budget, we're going to continue to use the master plan as our guide. And that results in about 690,000 trips, or about a 6% increase, or about an extra 39,000 trips. You also heard me mention a few times that with the new AOD legislation in place of January this year, that we're starting to see an uptick in ridership. What you'll see here is before January 1st of this year, on average in any given month, there used to be about 100 new clients monthly that became eligible to use TransHelp. With the new legislation in place of January this year, that number is more than doubled. So we're seeing 200 new clients every month joining TransHelp services and continuing to go beyond that. So the demand for the increased demand for services is in fact real. When we look at new clients applying for TransHelp, and existing clients that are recertifying to use TransHelp, 86% of our clients actually receive some level of service, whether it be temporary, conditional, or unconditional. And as a result, the remaining 14% actually don't receive any level of service. And to date, with the new legislation in place, less than 1% of those eligibility decisions are actually appealed. If you recall through previous presentations, the AODA also requires us to recertify our existing client base to ensure they're still eligible for TransHelp. Over the past 12 to 18 months, we've sent out several reminders to our clients, reminding them and reminding them again of the changes that they expect to see. So far this year, out of our 17,000 client files, we've reviewed 11,000 of them. In many cases, out of this, this 17,000, we actually realized that we had a number of clients on file that are actually no longer using our services. 
So in fact today, despite having 17,000 client files, there's closer to about 9,000 people that use our service today. And out of that 9,000, we've reviewed 6,000 of them thus far. So if you recall a couple seconds ago on the last slide, just as a reminder, 86% of our clients that apply for our service receive some level of service, and less than 1% of them are appealed. We're continuing to review these applications on a daily basis. And once everyone's eligibility is confirmed, one by one, they will receive a personalized letter notifying them of the outcome of that eligibility. This process will be completed over the next six to nine months from now. Also, due to some sound advice from our advisory committee, we've also spent time with the councillor EA teams from the city of Mississauga, city of Brampton, and the town of Caledon, just to prepare them to take calls in case they receive any feedback from clients directly. I'm going to shift gears here for a second. Um, I've just spent you know, the last five minutes or so uh, providing a brief update on master plan. I'm going to shift over into talking to you quickly about service delivery, and then I'm going to close off on the last slide with a quick update on 2018 budget. First, for a quick update on Caledon Community Services, or, or CCS here on end, and the Canadian Red Cross, which are both vital parts of our service delivery. First, as most of you know, CCS helps to deliver paratransit services on the region's behalf within the town of Caledon. And that also includes a passenger assistance program as well. The town is currently conducting a feasibility study, as many of you may know, to assess the opportunity of potentially introducing conventional transit within the town. TransHelp is going to partner with the town in that study. At the same time, in partnership with the LINs and other stakeholders, we'll also be, perform be performing a study to assess what the optimal service delivery structure should be to best service Caledon needs. Moving over to the right, on to the Canadian Red Cross side, and just for a bit of context for those of you that may or may not know, um, they help deliver some of our dialysis trips and also participate in the passenger assist program as well. The Red Cross has actually been performing their own bit of soul searching, trying to figure out what line of service they want to be in. And they've actually come to the conclusion that the services they provide on behalf of TransHelp will need to be transitioned away from them. Now, from a dialysis perspective, TransHelp will repatriate those level, that, that, uh, that level of work from Red Cross. And we believe it will integrate well within our service delivery. This transition, to just a note, will not result in any change to the level of service that they're actually receiving today. We'll start notifying cl customers uh, shortly, informing them of the change, and the transition should take place in partnership with the Red Cross probably about three to six months from now. From a passenger assistance program perspective, the answer is not as clear cut. Um, and again, with partnership with the LIN, uh, we're going to need to find some alternative delivery options to meet those clients' needs. Continuing on the theme of service delivery, and, and many of you may or may not know this today, but close to two-thirds of our trips today are actually delivered through third parties, whether it be taxi vendors, uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian Red Cross, or CCS. And the balancing one-third is delivered through our TransHelp bus operators. In reviewing a service delivery and the associated financials, we've recently uncovered that over the last few years, we've made investments to deliver our trip growth, which has not been previously captured in our budget. This is part of the reason why, through our training we're reporting to Council, Staff has highlighted operating shortfalls to budget in recent years. This increased demand has largely been filled by the use of part-time regional bus operators. As a result, in the 2018 proposed budget for TransHelp, an additional million dollars will be included to capture the use of part-time, the current use of part-time staff to meet this existing demand that we're seeing today. However, with the proposed investments in business intelligence, which I'll get on in the next slide, We'll look to assess to see what the best service delivery model is to best service this growth. And we'll come back to Council in late spring of next year <coughs> to update you on the findings. And lastly, uh, just to close off with a quick 2018 budget preview for TransHelp. So based on the progress we've made today so far in the master plan and some of the findings that I've uncovered during, the, or during our collective team uh, service delivery review, the 2018 proposed budget will suggest an increase of $3.7 million, or 18.8%. And there's really three things that drive that. First, there's a 6% trip growth of 39,000 trips, which is in line with the master plan, which we talked about a few slides ago. There's also an investment in three FTEs, which are also included in our master plan. And investments, these investments are in three things. First, in client service, to meet the growing number of applicants that we've talked about before, and continuously provide our clients clear, timely, fair, and consistent outcomes. Secondly, there's also a continued focus on quality. We currently have one, one transit inspector in place to support our seven-day-a-week operation. 
just for context for you, what a transit inspector does, they basically drive around the region every day they're on shift just to perform quality audits on either our buses or our, our third-party vendors to make sure the customer experience is what we want it to be. Right now, an investment in a second inspector uh, will help support the increased growth, but also ensure we have more coverage or better coverage to support our seven-day-a-week operation. And lastly, we want to continue our investment in, in business intelligence, which I've touched on a few times earlier on today, to inform decision-making, to ensure we always have a pulse in trying to find new efficiencies, and also to continually assess potential third-party third or, or other alternate service delivery models. And lastly, as you can see on the slide, and as I mentioned on the, uh, earlier on, the budget will reflect a permanent $1 million adjustment to capture past annual investments to support previous trip growth. However, while the financial amount will be included in the budget proposal, the FTE impact will not be included. With the, again, with the proposed investment in business intelligence, which I talked about earlier, staff will perform a study to assess the optimal service <coughs> delivery option to support this demand. So we will review the findings and the obvious analysis with Council late in the spring of next year, and any potential FTE requests to complement that financial investment will be recommended then. And that uh, concludes our review for this morning. Any, uh, okay. any questions? Yeah. I'm sure we're going to have questions, Parish. comments. If you just raise your hand, so... Okay, oh. <laughs> uh, Councillor Sato. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on, on your presentation, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of it, but I did read the slides, um, do we have a capital increase this year as well for additional buses? Is uh, it your, your numbers seem to relate to operations. <coughs> Yeah, through the chair, uh, not in 2018. Um, part of what we are trying to do is, with the investors of business intelligence and some of the quality people that we're looking for, one of the things we want to do is really assess what the best service delivery model is uh, to best service the region's needs at, at an, in, in an efficient manner. So right now, this year, we're not actually asking for any capital associated with buses. Um, and that's not to suggest that we're not going to do anything in the future. But until we assess what the right mix is to both deliver to deliver our trips either through buses or taxis, um, we're going to hold off and to, just to make sure that what we're asking for is, is the right thing. So you feel that the number of clients that have um, that have been recertified and that six percent increase in in the client base can be accommodated by the existing number of buses and um, available taxis? Yes. I'd say at least for 2018. Yes, I think on, on the on the bus side, we have a limited capacity of what we can do. Yeah. And we always try to get better every year with a bit of efficiencies. Um, but we've got nine taxi vendors in place. Uh, and as we go down the list, there's there's sufficient capacity, at least in 2018, to help deliver that growth. And we've got two on standby on top of that, as long as we give advance warning to, that um, that could step up and help deliver some service as well. So does that accommodate... Um, I sit on the Accessibility Advisory Committee at Mississauga, and one of the issues that has always been with regard to TransHelp and the taxis have helped a lot is the um, the short, uh, sorry, the short bookings, uh, more immediate bookings, the length of time, um, advance time that a trip has to be booked, and also those late night um, uh, trips that cannot be done by taxi but need to be done by TransHelp. So does the 2018, your budget for 2018, cover that level of customer service as well? What it does cover from a, from a customer service perspective, we've actually extended our booking hours to be able to book a trip. So up till earlier this year, and this is in the 18 budget as well, um, all trips need to be booked by 8 o'clock p.m. the night before. Right. We've actually extended that to midnight. So we're hoping that by midnight, if anyone has plans for the next day, um, we, we, that could get accommodated within that time frame. Okay. Uh, I think that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Miles. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to start off um, by thanking the staff who have been working on this um, this planning group for quite some time. I know some of the members of the of the staff planning team are in the audience. I have to tell you, serving on the on the subcommittee, that this has been a very complex um, process that staff have gone through. But they've gone through it 
with great sens sensitivity for the clients that they serve. And I also feel that they've been very innovative in their approach to addressing the needs of, of the clients. And the changes in the AODA legislation have been, uh, I don't want to say put upon us, because I think, in fact, in the long run, they're very positive and they're meeting the needs of a, of a larger, more vulnerable group in our society that need help. And I think staff, they, we really need as a council to recognize the amazing job that they have done. At our last committee meeting, when we were presented with the impact on the budget, the, the members of the committee kind of sat back and said, ooh, you know, it's a, it, it is a huge increase in the overall budget, and that's why we asked staff to come and do a comprehensive uh, presentation to you today so you would understand exactly what we're dealing with. And uh, I think this, this is just the beginning, um, but staff have really got an amazing handle on, um, I think, on the complexities and some of the ways in which to deal with that. So I wanted to, I wanted to recognize that first and thank you. Um, the budget is, is the budget. I mean, when we get calls for service, we have got to respond based on legislation. And if council doesn't support the amount of dollars that are being requested in the budget, we will not be able to do that. It, it will be impossible. So I think it's just really important for members of council to understand before we get into the budget process, like many things that we deal with um, as a council, this is legislation by the province of Ontario and that we as a council have to be responsive to it. But I think from sitting back and from my point of view, um, it's good legislation, it's good changes, and I think some of the things that we are going to be able to do in partnering with the municipalities with accessible transportation is going to be positive and will probably broaden the quality of life for many of the people who are using TransHelp today because they are, are going to be educated and encouraged to use other forms of transportation that's readily available to them. So all in all, I think from, um, uh, from a human um, capacity standpoint, this, this is really good legislation, but at the end of the day, it does come down to dollars and cents, and we as a, a council really have to be responsive to that. So thank you, thank you for your presentation, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully, with educating council, it will be easier at budget time. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Sprovieri. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, you indicated that um, the new policy has drastically increased the number of uh, people that qualify for the service. Uh, by how much uh, did you, you didn't really did you say by how much it's 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 doubled so on a, on a monthly basis it used to be on average about a hundred new clients on a monthly basis and it's more than doubled to over 200 applicants on a monthly basis this year okay and through the chair has <clears throat> has the new policy omitted some of the people who used to qualify and or are they just basically broadened the um, the qualification uh, with a new policy the through the chair, um, everything has been expanded. So no one that was previously um, uh, eligible before, um, there's no one that's excluded now. It, you, the expansion, it basically, it's expanded uh, eligibility. If, if I can add to that. Um, so, you know, TransHelp is 35 years old, right? And the world has changed in 35 years. And, and through the investments of the municipal councils, um, the level of service <clears throat> that is offered through Brampton Transit and My Way is significantly different than it was 35 years ago. So at one time, TransHelp was somebody's only option. And through developing support mechanisms, um, we're trying to encourage uh, those individuals who can, uh, when they can, to access the accessible fleets that are available. So I wouldn't say that anybody who was eligible before would no longer be eligible, however, the way the service would be delivered to them might change um, as um, 
they're supported to use a more integrated model. Mm. And uh, through the chair, um, the the new <coughs> the new crop of people who qualify now that didn't qualify previously, how do they get around uh, those people in the past? Did they, they how, uh, how do they make out? Uh, did they were they forced to use public transit or were they forced for their families to uh, take them to the hospital or to the doctor or shopping or wherever the people go? Uh, so, I, I, so what I'm getting at is that you know, perhaps uh, the new policy has just made it really easy for people who used to uh, be able to uh, to manage uh, previously, through, whether through public transit or whether through family assistance, and now they're just relying on uh, on the taxpayer to provide this nice service, basically. Uh, is this what, what's happened with this new legislation? Through the chair, I, I'm not sure if we're in a position to comment uh, on how people met their transit needs before they became eligible. I'm sure there's a combination of people weren't traveling as much as they like to, or they were more reliant on family and friends. Um, there's no data that we have that, that tells what people's travel habits were before and, and now. Uh, but I would, in my personal humble opinion, I think uh, through studies that were completed at some point in time that drove the change in legislation, um, there were barriers to people not being able to, to enjoy the, the, the human impact of life, which is why the change took place. But, but unfortunately, we just don't have those stats to, to be able to share. So, so Councillor, maybe uh, David uh, can help us with a little bit. Yeah, sure. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to reinforce what Steve ended with, which is that what's driving the change in legislation was to give equal opportunity to all uh, residents of, of Ontario um, so that regardless of what barriers they have, uh, they have equal access to public service. So in the past, it was, uh, TransHelp was limited to those who had a physical inability to use conventional transit. Usually they were people who relied on walkers or wheelchairs for mobility. Um, what, so, um, and we also provided in the past uh, a short period of adjustment for people who were visually impaired. But after we had trained, done some training with them on how to use transit, they were then uh, to use public, um, yeah, conventional transit. What's happened now is, as you've heard through the presentation, is that not only the eligibility for trans help has changed to allow it to be available to people, all, all residents, regardless of their challenges. We've also, at the same time, changed conventional transit to, uh, at the city level to make that more available for uh, residents, regardless of their uh, um, disabilities or limited abilities. So it's really uh, um, trying to enable equal access to public service for all people. <clears throat> and, and I appreciate the, uh, the intent, uh, certainly. Uh, it just, I'm just wondering uh, like if, we're just, if the new policy has made it a lot easier uh, for, to access a service where people used to find other means uh, in the past and maybe public transit was a means and now they're, uh, they're using uh, TransHelp, which is uh, putting a huge burden on it. You see the, the request, 18% increase in the, in the budget, that's a huge hit. And um, it, just a final question through the chair. Uh, the province who's made this um, requirement, are they, are they chipping in? And are they providing any subsidy or funding uh, for this at all? Or is this us? We just have to go to our taxpayers uh, uh, again for uh, to, to, to cover the costs. There's, uh, through the chair, there's no incremental subsidy over and above what we're receiving today to help fund this. So yes, it's being funded through the taxpayer. Uh, I don't know how, how much we can go after the ta poor taxpayer. You know. For you know, they won't be able to pay the property taxes and then the whole system would just collapse. You know, done for. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillor. Okay, first of all, uh, uh, Councillor Ross, sorry, I was debating who had their hand up no, first. Up first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Steve, for your presentation today. Uh, I'm just trying to reconcile in my brain here. The, um, the chart that you show on page five, um, the recommended service model, is that the one that you're coming forward with today based on the um, uh, what you're anticipating right. in 2018? Yeah. It's the blue line, yes. Okay, so if... If you 
don't change our current system, then the increases would be that much more the significant. Yes. Okay. So if we do nothing, it's the red line. If Perfect. implement the plan, it's the blue. Okay. Uh, and when you come back at budget time, are you going to show a longer term um, uh, financial plan for uh, TransHealth? I, I would like to be in a position to do that. I, I th it's a little early. Okay. With the legislation just coming in place nine months ago, um, and even talking with uh, our bordering cities and bordering region and other partners, we're all in a bit of a wait and see mode right now. You know, this year I would say, or for next year I'd <coughs> say, we're using the master plan as a guide. But I, I would say ourselves and talking to our partners and other cities and regions, we're all kind of waiting and seeing, to be honest with you. Um, because I, I, my, my personal opinion, I won't say this reflects anyone else's, is that once, I'm not sure if the average resident that uh, knows that the legislation has changed and that they are now eligible for this service, that's going to take time to permeate through the public. So are we doing anything to communicate that or is the the province because it's their legislative changes? Um, it's a good question. I know the province has you know, Dave, are you aware of any communication? Are we going to keep it a secret? No, 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 it's not that's not what we want to do. So we we, we, we do a lot of work with uh, stakeholder groups um, who um, um, have clear relevant clients uh, that would be potential applicants um, to um, manage their expectations, both uh, what we are and what we're not, and how we can help them, and, and how it's in some cases beyond uh, what a transit agency can do. Um, we don't advertise our service when we're trying to attract clients, but we try to uh, make sure that we're connected to the people who we know need us or we have working relationships in the past to make sure that. Um, you know, the, the process is as smooth as possible. Now, do we have um, uh, re trip requirements? So if, if we have, uh, say, the, there's too many requests for trips, do we just deny people, or what are their options? No, <coughs> in general, we, we, don't, we don't deny trips. Okay. I think we've got enough flexibility using our third-party vendors, which has got quite a bit of capacity, okay. that uh, whatever we can't fill on using a TransHub bus, uh, or for other reasons, then we leverage our third-party contractors, which again, they are also they already delivered two-thirds of our trips right today, okay. and there's capacity to grow that even more if we need to. Great, thank you. And to Councillor Sprovieri's uh, question about uh, when the province makes legislative changes and, and our property taxpayers are on the hook, that that's usually a rhetorical question, which is they typically don't uh, pony up with any funds. So we we ask that how many times? I'm seeing Nando nod every every policy issue. So uh, that was rhetorical, right? Yeah. Anyways, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Sato. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a comment because I want to follow up on Councillor Sprovieri's comment about the taxpayers being on the hook. And, you know, I agree with, uh, with, with Councillor Rouse. As she said, we didn't expect anything from the province when they brought in the legislation. However, it's the right thing to do. And I don't think you can put, quite honestly, you cannot put a dollar value on the quality of life of someone who has a disability to provide them with access to work, to shop, to doctor's appointments, to leisure activities, and basically to a life outside their home. And if, if we at this council ever start counting nickels and dimes on providing that quality of life and quality of service to our constituents who need it, then I think it's a very sad day for this council. You know, the, these, are, these are residents who cannot get around any other way. Some of them can use our transit services that we've provided and those that can do. But we are looking at serving the, the residents, the citizens of this region who have no other means of transportation. They don't have access to, to hopping in a car like the rest of us do or hopping on a bus at the end of the street, going out whenever they want to. They can't, even with this service, it's very difficult for them to, you know, someone calls them up and says, do you want to go out for a cup of coffee or shopping? They can't do that necessarily because they're dependent on having to book ahead of time to get this service. So they're already restricted. So yes, $3 million is a heck of a lot of money to be adding into the budget, but I personally think that it's money well spent, and I applaud staff for bringing this recommendation forward. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. I just want to reinforce that. Back when I was a member of Parliament, I had a family 
they came to Canada and were refused uh, status because there was a father, an able daughter who was 20, and three young boys who were all using walkers. They were all handicapped in one way or another. And they hid or took refuge in a church in Toronto in a church basement for two and a half years because they said if they went back to the Middle East, they could stay in one room morning, noon, and night and never leave the house. So they would rather live in the basement of a church and, and get a hearing here. The reason at the time we wouldn't keep them was they were going to be a, a burden on our health system. Eventually, we got them landed, and they were very productive here. The, the three boys all have jobs. They all work. They all contribute to society. But they said they'd rather die than go back and just be vegetables all day long. So what we do here is right, and I agree with Councillor Sato. I don't care what it costs. I mean, we're not going to be crazy, but we're doing a, a good job, and if it costs a bit of money, that's our good luck that we don't need it. And uh, it's a great country. Okay, seeing uh, nobody else on the board, no hands, no buttons. Um, the only thing is, uh, I'd like to comment is uh, on uh, Councillor Rass's uh, inquiry, uh, longer term. Is there something you can do on a what if basis or some sort of a pro forma to say, if we're rising at the same numbers and we continue on, if that can't, if it's on the same curve, can we do something like that for budget uh, for the next two, three years? I, I know that uh, it's all guesstimates, but I, I, I think it's helpful to say, okay, if it continues on the same line, where are we uh, three years from now? Through the chair, through the chair um, we, we can show something at budget. It'll, it'll just give them the, the time frames. It'll be, Extremely preliminary. Um, with a bit more time, we probably deliver something of higher quality. Okay, I mean that's. I mean, I, I just think that if this were a business model, uh, you can't stop at year 2018. I mean, it, you, you do a what if. I mean, or it yeah. could be down. But I think if it, it'd be just helpful. That's all. Yeah. Uh, Jeanette, I got your hand up. If I could recommend to council, certainly in the budget, we do have some outlook years. What I would like to do, because we're right in the process of finalizing all the budget documents now, is come back to you um, kind of uh, middle of next year, spring, late spring, with another presentation like this. That'll have given us a full year with the new legislation. Some of this business intelligence that uh, Steve and the team want to do to really be able to crunch numbers and things more. And we could come back with a, a more fulsome presentation um, prior to the 2019 budget to walk through all those different scenarios and what we're seeing. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, moved by Councillor Rass, seconded by Councillor or Mayor uh, Jeffrey. All in favor? Carried. Thank you, Stephen. David, good Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the uh, second item that we have related uh, to public works is the engineering services for the GE Booth uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant. That was a consent? Oh, okay. Okay, back to you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, brings us to items related to health. Uh, Councillor Moore, if you chair this section, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Dale. I just want to remind members of Council that uh, there was a booklet handed out. Uh, there was a copy of it in your agenda, but this is the uh, the print copy. Uh, it's there, and I understand, Councillor Gibson, you asked that this be withdrawn from consent or yes. not put into consent? Yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I look at this report as being a, a pretty good news story in consideration when we uh, look at other communities and the epidemic that they're having in other communities. And I wanted staff to have the opportunity to highlight why we're doing and what we're doing in order to make sure that we don't get into the predicament that some of the other communities uh, have got into. So I only pulled it for that. It's in the report, but I think it's, it's good to highlight it and let the public understand it so they can hear what staff are doing with this. So if we can have staff speak to that, please. Doctor? Uh, so through the chair, I don't 
I have a mic. Uh, thank you. Um, so through the chair, uh, thank you so much, Councillor Gibson, for your questions. Within the, um, the report booklet, I would uh, point Council to page 15, table 10. And this is a comparison of opioid-related deaths and mortality by public health unit. And you can see that Peel uh, is much lower than many of our comparator uh, municipalities, such as Hamilton or Toronto. And so I think this is about opportunity for Peel at this point in time. We are very fortunate that we are not seeing the deaths that are being seen in Toronto or that are being seen out in Western Canada. And so now is the time for us to develop a comprehensive strategy. And to that end, uh, we are using something that's known as the Four Pillars Framework, which is something that's used globally. It has four areas of focus, prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and enforcement. And that is supported by good local data. Um, we are planning to hold a senior leaders stakeholder meeting before the end of the year to continue planning in this area. In terms of work that's happened to date, uh, surveillance and understanding the problem and the result is this report that you have with you. There's also been considerable work to plan for if we were to see a large number of overdoses in the community, what would we do and how would we respond to those? And so we have a draft plan in place that is out with consultation with our key stakeholder groups and we're planning to do a tabletop exercise in January. So this is really about the opportunity for Peel to be in front of the issue and uh, ahead of it so that we'll be prepared if we start seeing more deaths in the community. Thank you for that. I just, um, I don't want to downplay the problem that is happening across Canada with this, but um, I think it's, important that our residents know that we're on top of it or we're doing our best to be on top of it. And I, I thank staff for that. It's, it's being very proactive and thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Mayor Crombie. There it is, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, it is such a complex problem. You know, it affects healthcare, human services, our criminal justice system. It's um, and uh, I want to thank you for the report. I know that Mayor Jeffrey and I had asked for this to come forward because we'd been meeting with the uh, big city mayors across the country. And of course, we needed an action plan that spoke to our community and our needs, a local response um, on this crisis as it moves across the country. No one is immune to it. To it. So um, I want to thank you. I was shocked by some of the findings, particularly the rate of people in grades children, 7 to 12, who have experimented with opioid drugs because they're available in their household. That's just shocking to me. I think parents need to do a better job <laughs> of keeping their medicines locked away or their prescription medicines, in that case, locked away and out of the reach of young their, their, their children. So I want to thank you for this. Um, you know, no one is immune, as I said, no community, and I'm glad we have a plan. Um, uh, to, to th which will speak to prevention, as you said, harm reduction, treatment, and then enforcement ultimately, unfortunately. So thank you for doing this. I thought it was a great exercise and it's very well done. I'm happy to second it if you want to move it. Councillor Gibson. Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, I'm going to look to the clerk to see if you have any names on the board. I have Councillor McFadden. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to go on what the mayor is uh, saying about it being available in the home. And it's nice to see that the pharmacies now make you sign for any um, narcotics that you're bringing out. And that um, when it comes to the fentanyl patch, that they make you bring back the old patches um, to the pharmacy so they can destroy them. Because what was happening is they were putting them in the garbage. And if your children knew, or any of their friends knew that you were using the patch, they could go through the garbage and melt them down or eat them. Wow. So, and it's good that they're monitoring the fact that, okay, you've got 12 or 15, you have to bring back the 12 or 15, and then you get the new ones. So it's being um, monitored at a good rate, and I appreciate the province at least going through with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stark? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment also um, on what the uh, mayor or Mayor Crombie indicated. The the incidence of Peel students, I guess students all over the country. I mean, it is shocking. 
uh, especially when you say it's, uh, or the report says it's non-medicinal, non-prescription drugs that are available, um, and one in five are experimenting. I was with five teenagers the other day, and and uh, and I I just thought of that. I said, okay, one of those has the opportunity to do something. The whole classroom, then there's five or six or seven kids. And they're kids, basically. And I think we have to do a better job of education. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a province responsibility or partly ours or whatever, but uh, the message has to get out there when you re read the stats and it's going straight up. It's almost as if everyone is fearless at the, at the younger people. And when you see the deaths that are occurring up to age 44, uh, you know, there's a whole group of people, I don't even think they know what they're taking. Uh, you know, but they probably do, but I'm just saying the impact of what they're taking has to uh, be uh, more broadly, the information has to be disseminated. It's, this is serious. I know Mayor Crombie said this uh, and Mayor Jeffrey for quite a while, and, and every, every report you read, and you read all these deaths, uh, it's only going to be a matter of time before the whole thing filters down to our younger population. And that's the scary part. That's the really scary part that, uh, you know, maybe they needed money, that group between 25 and 40, 45, whatever, they have money to pick this up, or maybe they can get a prescription. You know, and, and uh, it's the same way as other illicit drugs and smoking materials and all the rest of it. it just moves moves down, and I think we have to do a better job. I don't, I'm not sure how we do that, but uh, maybe the uh, medical officer can uh, comment. But uh, if we don't do it, we're going to be sitting here, you know, a number of years from now because there'll be other worse drugs coming on, and we didn't do our part. So, thank you, Councillor Starr. Uh, Dr. Hopkins. So through the chair, uh, thank you very much for that question. Prevention is a really important part and one of those four key pillars of a comprehensive approach to <coughs> opioid misuse. And yes, there is always uh, work that we can do to continue to encourage young people not to, uh, to use drugs. We work closely with school boards because that is one of the places. Um, and the police also work closely with school boards around trying to prevent young people from uh, starting to use drugs. There is also work that we recognize um, young people do tend to take a lot of risks, not just with drug use, but in other areas of their lives as well. And so one of the things that we try to do is a harm reduction approach as well that encourages young people to do things safely. So if people are going to choose to use drugs, using with someone else who's there, you know, having someone who knows how to use naloxone, calling 911 if those overdoses occur. And there are also things, as Councillor McFadden alluded to, that people can do at home as well. Many of the prescription drugs that young people have access to are found in the home. And so I'm sure many of you have had the experience where maybe you've gone in for dental surgery or a minor procedure where you've been prescribed things like Tylenol number three or other types of opioid medications and you actually <coughs> don't need the entire bottle. Most of us just put that into the medicine cabinet. Um, but I would encourage all of the families out there to actually take those to the pharmacy where they can be disposed of so that they don't become accessible to the young people in your lives. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's, Thank you. That's fine. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Yeah, I, I'm just, there's a disconnect. I've been just looking at um, regional appeal statistics and zeroing in on 21 division for my own good reasons. And as I'm reading them, crimes against persons are going up 8.3%. Drug control, drug crimes generally go da went down 14.3% last year. And then you look at crimes in schools to do with drugs, they're down 10%. And the numbers are really low. It's like 20 arrests um, going down to 18. So I just hope we're not getting on the Trump wagon. And he loves big crimes against things and wars against drugs. And I, I, I'm curious as to why these stats don't match the stats I'm hearing here today because that's very alarming to me. The police statistics I've always had faith in. But uh, I just hope we're not, you can't over-dramatize even a single death, but I really wish our, our stats backed each other up because 
this one, and I went through it by each police division last night. And each one had the drug incidents going down in, in young students and in kids and in schools. So I don't get it. Could you explain that? Yeah, so through the chair, I don't have the police statistics in front of me, so I, I can't speak directly to what you're, uh, you're discussing. In terms of the data that we used to get the information on the percentage of students that are using drugs, this is self-report. So this is students who are telling us um, that they're using those drugs um, for non-medical uh, non purposes. And so it's based on self-report. We, we aren't out there knowing exactly that they're doing that, um, and there can be discrepancies in what people say they do and what actually happens. So that is a limitation to the data. I think when you come back to this as an overall issue, um, and, and Council has already highlighted this, it is right now we're talking about opioids. But it could be a different drug in the future. And so one of the things that public health is doing is how do we shift to a comprehensive drug strategy for all of Peel Region, looking at those four pillars, that will prepare us for any drug that happens to come our way. And so while we're focused on opioids right now, there's actually a much larger story to this, and we do want to be prepared and responding appropriately to any drugs. Well, I do agree with self-reporting being um, not the best type of statistical data gathering. Um, but I also point out that uh, smoking is going down all over North America because they're going into the elementary schools and they're teaching the small children to annoy the heck out of the adults in their families that smoke. So I think the, the education has to start at a young age. It has to be well organized in the schools. And it doesn't have to focus on one drug. It has to focus on all medicines and all drugs and all inhalants and all the nonsense people put in their bodies. Because those are the little soldiers that'll go out and get their parents or their older brothers and sisters to stop doing it. So um, it's tried and true. Uh, it's worked on cigarette smoking. So I think the strategy should be one that's all encompassing like that. But yeah, thank you for your answers. I, I tend to agree with you on the self-reporting. I can remember back in the dark ages when I went to high school, everybody admitted to having sex and none of them had. <laughs> but there were a few pregnancies. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Councillor Parrish, one of the uh, disconnects may be that this is a 2016 statistics and your statistics I'm may be more 16. current. Oh, okay. In any event, the report has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, that's carried. And uh, Mr. Chairman, everything else was in consent. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, brings us to items related to human services. Uh, Council Medeiros, if you'd chair this section, please. Thank you. I believe we still have a members of council. They have before you items 13.1, and we have a presentation by Sonia Pace, uh, Community Partnerships, and Sandra Solnick, Supervisor of Community Development, regarding the Neighborhood Information Tool. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Dale and members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. We are, uh, our presentation is accompanying the report that was just referred to, the Neighbourhood Information Tool. We're here to give you a very, very high level um, demonstration of that particular tool. It's a, a mapping tool and a great mechanism to help us support um, local planning with regards to our community needs. Um, I believe we have continue to have technical difficulties, so we're hoping that this uh, is going to uh, let us show you that the map in itself. Um, so now I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to Sandra Solnick, who will do the demonstration. Thank you. Good morning. Aligned to the region's strategic priority of living, improving people's lives in their time of need, the Neighborhood Information Tool shares data through a geographic map of each municipality. The Miscible Map utilizes data to build a stronger understanding of community needs, inform local planning and decision making using evidence, and the map includes a calculated well-being index to inform priorities. Also you will see in the demonstration the tool has the capability to map community assets which are community spaces, resources and services. The map is divided into service delivery areas or STAs. These are census-based geographic areas informed by population. Using service delivery areas ensures consistency of the data that is comparable and reliable. 
The tool was developed through municipal, community, and regional partnerships and was based on best practices and research of similar data sharing tools from other municipalities. Community stakeholders were engaged to validate the data being used and the value of the well-being index. Following, the City of Mississauga Neighborhood Information Tool was finalized and discussions with the City of Brampton to expand the tool begun. As referenced earlier, the well-being index is a combination of variables to produce a measure of neighborhood well-being. There are six domains that contribute to neighborhood well-being. Social demographics, economic opportunity, resident engagement and community belonging, safety, health, and physical environment. In the chart, you will also see on the right 21 indicators across the domains. The data is gathered through the various sources such as Statistics Canada, and Veronics, Peel Regional Police, and Missable Data. To provide you with a better understanding of the Neighborhood Information Tool, we will now provide a high-level overview of the tool. I think it's working. It's working. <laughs> Good. Um, the tool provides an informed look at communities and does not look at municipalities or service delivery areas through a deficit lens, but rather holistic and opportunity-based planning lens to improve well-being. When you open the tool, you will see this pop-up, which provides an overview of what the tool is and assists with how you can use the information and how you can navigate the tool. When the tool is peel-wide, we will have tabs along the top that you can click on for specific municipalities to view their data and indicators separately. The map is displays the service delivery areas as I referenced earlier. The areas are color coded in relation to the well-being index you see in the legend. The lighter the color, the higher the well-being. Also in the legend, you will see a list of assets that we can select and view on the map. I'll select community centers and settlement centers as an example. So the map is really difficult to see at this view, so we can zoom it in to see a better view. And as we zoom, additional streets appear that help us navigate and find specific locations within the map. For example, if we select this area, when we click on it, we also see the population or dwellings within that community. We can close out the larger map and then view all 21 data indicators <coughs> by domain. Also in this area, there are definitions listed below the indicators that explain what each indicator is and also the source. So to provide you with a very high level overview, if we look at social demographics, we can see that over a quarter of the population in the specific service delivery area are children and youth between the age of zero and 19 years. This is valuable information when having local discussions around the services that are available for that population. As we scroll down, we continue to see the rest of the domains. However, if we look at physical environment, we can look at proximity to food retailers in the second column, which is 40% of the population are within a 10 minute or 800 meter walk of fresh food. We could also go back and click on the larger map and look at the assets and select fresh foods, which would help inform where those locations are. This could lead to informing discussions around planning of that community, to help us decide planning decisions and future development. Overall, the components of the tool should not be viewed in isolation, but rather in combination with other data and community information to have a wholesome planning discussion. Currently, we are focusing on developing a PL-wide tool. We are working closely with City of Brampton staff to finalize the tool late 2017, and we have started discussions with the town of Caledon to expand the tool. Internally, we are starting to use this tool across the corporation to inform regional planning, 
and we are reviewing the information with our municipal partners in order to identify opportunities to better align our services and resources. We will use 2016 census data when it is fully released later this year to rerun the data and to update the tool. Councillors can access the tool through the Peel Data Centre or obtain ward-specific information through their municipal community services staff. The tool is not intended to be a comprehensive information source that is compared across service delivery areas, but rather a first step in asking questions, gathering information, and having planning discussions. The development of the tool could not be possible without our municipal partners from the City of Mississauga, City of Brampton, and Town of Caledon as we work together to share data and plan for our communities. Um, thank you, Sandra. So in the interest of time, we just skimmed over the, uh, the presentation um, and only actually looked at two domains and not in great detail. So I, I would like to offer up that as much as this is a user-friendly tool, um, this did not give you a full picture of what its capability is. Um, and we certainly offer to uh, in meet individually with you or your staff to go through this at a greater in greater detail at any time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, um, these are interesting when you see technology merge type of information that we can get at our fingertips. Um, and I saw that uh, 2011 census was referenced and I'm sure that this is going to be updated accordingly as we keep getting the, those numbers. We're doing that as we speak now. Fantastic. Um, are there any questions, comments? Uh, yes, Councillor Sato. Thank you. Um, this is an absolutely amazing tool, probably the most uh, comprehensive amount of data on our neighborhoods that, uh, that we've ever had and very helpful. I just can't figure out how to access it. <laughs> um, could you send us, uh, perhaps to each of us, an email with exact directions on mm -hmm. how we as members of council can access the data? I, I can see it being extremely helpful um, as, as we're working in our communities. And also, I'm sure many of us can, um, will be able to uh, come back with other requests for additional services um, that maybe staff have not identified through, um, through identifying it. And, and I can see it also helping the agencies that operate in our community that, um, now, do, do they have, what, what is the outside access to this information? So through the chair, the link will be put on the Peel Data Centre, and we will be communicating out to those community stakeholders, okay. providing information and overview of the tool, and probably working with our municipal partners to provide drop-in uh, either demonstrations or perhaps mm -hmm. a webinar we're looking at, so people know how to navigate the tool. Okay. We're also, when we receive requests or we're engaged in the community, we are sharing the information from the tool and bringing awareness through the direct meetings. So I assume that this would be shared, uh, for example, with all the food banks that are located in um, right now in the city of Mississauga and Brampton, so that I, I can see this being of great help to them as well. Yes. Thank you. And when is it when is it going to be live on the website? We will be putting it on after today. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I couldn't find That's it why, now. Yes. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any further? Okay. Uh, so thank, thank you very much. You. Presentation moved by Councillor Sato, seconded by Councillor Ras. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Our next item is Community Hubs Planning Framework. Are there any questions, comments? Councillor Parrish? Yes. 13.2. I think both of us, I think uh, Councillor Downey wanted to speak to it as well, and I'd like to give her the floor first because she knows more about it. <laughs> How's that? But put me back on. Sounds good. Thank you for that, through you, Chair. Um, I guess um, I think it, it, you know, we're going in the right direction. But the province has um, put out this initiative, and um, one hundred fifty thousand dollars to study it more. In Peel, we're already doing it. And we're doing it well. We have hubs that are, um, you know, basically desperate for sustainable funding. And um, so to, to spend money on studying something that we're already doing well is a bit of a conundrum for me. Um, they are really, they're looking for sustainability and annualized funding, not just development dollars. So um, although 
I think that we're pointing in the right direction. I would maybe like to give staff um, a little bit more direction in reviewing the best practices of other jurisdictions and then come back with a report that outlines options for um, an enhanced regional role. No. There we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, the point of this new funding is actually to help new hubs develop, do the local needs analysis, and make sure that they have a robust business plan before they go forward. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of ongoing organizations and hubs, I think it's important to remember that hubs are not a program, they're just a service delivery model. So we work with organizations and agencies that have to work very hard to sustain funding and seek new sources of funding in order to be sustainable. And that's not really what this initiative is addressing, but certainly would be happy to go back again and take another look at what some of the best practices are and come back to council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Uh, Councillor Parrish? Yes, um, I'm, I'm constantly frustrated by the fact that I have a large dead swimming pool in Malton and it's attached to uh, Lincoln Alexander Secondary School and when the community centre was built they decommissioned the pool. The pool's heating and plumbing and everything's all connected into the school. So the city bought the school, they own the, pro the school the, or the uh, pool, the school owns the rest of the building but you've got this giant room with change rooms and washrooms that's locked with chains and locks, that's heated, that the plumbing runs through it and it's being put to absolutely no use. So we've looked at a couple of uh, attempts at a hub there. One of the difficulties is um, that a lot of the groups that would go in there, uh, Wellfort Health Group, um, some of the um, immigration settlement groups that we have at the Malton Community Center jammed in, they all get provincial funding. So if you put them all under one roof, you're cutting down on rent, which they, the city wouldn't charge them rent to start with. I think you need to start doing exactly what you said, and, and don't do a general 150,000, let's see what works. Start zeroing in on, on trouble areas. There's one in Rexdale that works beautifully. We're right across the road from Rexdale, our population's the same. I always say, it's like having the principality of Monaco, except I have no oceans and no money. I have lots of poor people but we are all one little principality up there. We are connected to nothing. So that would be an ideal location. The need is there. And the funding isn't that important because Wellfort gets provincial funding. The community services get provincial funding. All of them together can pool their money and pool that space. What they don't have is the $3 million it's gonna to take to put a mezzanine in there, close in the pool, and get the thing working. So that's what I want you to do. I don't want more studies done. I want you to focus in on the areas of greatest need, analyze what groups could go in there, take a look at what provincial funding they have now, and come back to me and say, okay, it's gonna be $3 million principal expense. See if the city will put in a million, we'll put in two million, and let's just do it. I am not a patient person and I'm now 71 years old. I want this thing done before I die. And it's needed. I can give you a million statistics that show you it's needed. So the 150, I'm not gonna argue with you, but I want you to start focusing, I want everybody to start focusing on practical implementation and stop thinking about it. And I don't want you to go study it. I just want you to fix my principality. Thank you. Yes. Verify the role of the $150,000. The funding is not for the region to go out and study hubs. The funding is to provide some seed money, if you'd like to call it that, to community organizations so that they can go out, determine where the greatest need is, take a look at how they could fill that need and come back with a business case so that there's some assurance that they are working towards a successful hub. Our experiences have been that upfront and stronger planning leads to stronger hubs. So it's, no, it's not really about the region studying it, it's about us providing some small funding to organizations who want to pursue a hub themselves.
a lot of these organizations are made up of volunteers, unfortunately. And I think when you say, I want a business case from a group in Malton, you're asking for a lot. I think it's the responsibility of the region and our social services to make the business case. And I think it's up to us to help organize these people. Uh, every time you throw it into the community and say, okay, you got a bunch of do-gooders, have to pick my kid up at three o'clock, have to take my mother to the doctor. You've got a lot of people that care very much. They don't have that glue to pull them all together. And that's our job. And I think it's social services job. And, and I'm not being critical, I'm just saying, um, I don't care if they've got a good business case that comes out of six organizations in the middle of Moulton. They can build you a case that'll make it sound like they can rule the world. I, what I want is you to go out there and say, okay, these are the interested groups. These are the, the funding, these are the amounts of funding they get. I'm going to build you a business case and let's see if we can make this work. I want us to take responsibility for it. I don't want you to say to them, go build a business case because nine times out of ten they're, un they're incapable. And you know yourself, it's like herding cats. You get them all together and they start elbowing each other and they go, I we'll be in charge. No, we'll be in charge. No, we'll be the prime. It's ju it just doesn't work. That's our job. That's why I was elected and that's why we have such a good staff here and I want you to do it. Thank you. Okay. Yep. I hear your feedback and definitely we will go back to staff and take another look at what the region's role is in terms of developing and sustaining community health. And by the way, I think you're doing an amazing job and I like you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just very cranky <laughs> these days and, uh, uh, and running short of time and I'm very impatient, so please forgive me. No, thank you and I like you as well. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> could be in trouble here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. And as we leave Monaco, I'll pass it over to <laughs> Brampton's Councillor uh, Gail Miles. Thanks. And now that the is over. <laughs> Sorry. The problem, with, the problem with this conversation is that a community hub can really be anything. It's a collaboration of groups that are providing a service to the community. So. I'm going to take council back to when we were doing the youth violence prevention initiative at the region of Peel. Our number one priority was that every school should be a community center or a community hub. That it should be a place for our young people and our youth to stay after school and have parents come in and volunteer and parks and recreation and perhaps the arts community or whatever, that's a community hub. Or a community hub could be like a neighborhood. We have a neighborhood in Brampton called Ardlen, which has had a number of tragic deaths. It's had fire. A church went in and created a community hub. And that community hub really just brings those resources together the people who can serve the community, they don't, they don't stay there. They just come and provide the support to the community when it's needed. And off of that offshoot, they branched out to another community that was in living in, or the people were living in poverty to provide support to them as well. So these dollars are really important because what these dollars can do is provide the financial support to an organization. I'm going to give you another scenario. I had a meeting with school board trustees and their issue, their, the biggest problem that they had was the fact that children were coming to school and, they, and the only meal that they were getting in a day was the breakfast program. So they were going home to uh, a house where the parents weren't there, there was no food. In a lot of cases, the teachers were um, keeping students in because they didn't have warm clothes. But in some of our schools, we've already started a program where they have a pantry. So if somebody knows there's no food at home, then they can go to the pantry before they go home and they can take something home to cook. It reminds me of when we did the Youth Violence Prevention Initiative. We asked a lot of young people, 
why do you commit? Why do you get involved in crime? And the, the answer was because I need to, to raise, I need to make money to help feed my siblings. So some of these things, um, you know, were, for us were, were very revealing. So where I'm going with this is, is that there are opportunities for anyone in the community to create a community hub, but a lot of them don't know how to do it. A lot of them don't have the knowledge or the expertise where this kind of, of a program, this kind of funding could help them develop their planning model. I think every school in the region of Peel should have a pantry and a clothing room. We run recycling centers and there's clothing in recycling centers. So why shouldn't we be creating a partnership with the recycling center so that if a child comes to school without mittens or a hat or warm clothing, the teacher can go into the closet and find something. And, and Martha, I mean, that's just a, that, that's a small example, but there's so much potential in our community. There's so, mo so much potential within our church organizations, our parent councils, whomever to create these community hubs but they're all going to be different they don't they don't have to look the same and so i think that this particular report is positive in that it's going to help develop perhaps the model that that other groups can use when they're going out there and developing a a community hub and i think as in the examples that were given, the problem is that the province, even though they, they're into their second year of really pushing this whole idea of community hubs, there's no funding. Um, we all know Janet Menard because she was the deputy minister here. And, and at AMO, they had a big booth on community hubs. And I said, oh, wow, I really want to see some community hubs get going in the city of Brampton and I took all of the information and I was lucky enough to get an audience with her and she said well there's no money there there isn't any money for community hubs even though they've got the community hub aligned with all these different ministries there isn't any dollars so the dollars are there but the dollars apparently are in the program areas so it's for the region of Peel I think this is, it's a beginning, it's, it's a way for agencies to be able to um, perhaps work with the, some of the professionals that we have at the Region of Peel to develop their own model. Hopefully we will be able to provide the networks to organizations like, like Ardglen, who has been very, very successful in developing their community hub model for a, a community that is living for a large part in poverty. So I think this is kind of the beginning and, and maybe along the way we'll be able to get the province because they're buying into it. They just haven't put the money there. So, you know, we need to be doing, I think we have to be doing some advocacy with the province to say, <coughs> yeah, we, this is, this is, collaboration is the way to go. I mean, we, we, the, the, um, the organization that was here at our last meeting that paid us back the $500,000 for the building. That's a community hub, but it's not, it's not the only thing a community hub can be. So um, I hope you will support this report, um, but I do think that we need to look for other ways to support um, community hubs in the same way that we supported the, the whatever it's called. <laughs> Somebody help me with the name of the of the organization that was here last week that paid back all of the money for it's, their uh, William Davis it's Catholic Family Services Catholic Family Services William Davis Center. That's that's sorry. That's the community help. So anyway, um, I hope you'll support the report. I think it's it's a good beginning, and I and I absolutely agree. We hope that the Region of Peel and the staff will continue to. Um, develop and look for resources to support community hubs in our neighborhood because we all know that collaboration is the best way to serve our community. 
Thank you, Councillor Miles. Uh, before I go to more questions, uh, CAO, would you like to say something? No? Oh, okay. Uh, I believe I had uh, Mayor Jeffrey on the board. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Miles finally got to where I wanted to speak about. I wasn't going to wade into this. Catholic Family Services is a really good example of a community hub, but it didn't happen overnight. And what uh, Councillor Parrish is talking about is really accelerating that process. So in my former life, trying to get all those groups under one roof was a mission, and then getting the province to recognize that they were actually doing what everybody wanted them to do was a mission, and their name was a problem because nobody understood what they did, and some groups felt uncomfortable going to a building that was Catholic Family Services, which is why they tried to use Bill Davis's name to, to modify how people looked at that facility. We're breaking new ground, and our staff are trying to break new ground, and I appreciate where they're going. It is a challenge. The devil will always be in the details, but we do need, if we want to accelerate this process, we have to insert ourselves into bringing those groups together because they don't have the capacity. They're going to get burned out. It's like when people applied for Trillium grants when I was an MPP. When I'd call somebody and say, congratulations, you got the money, I'd say, you have to pay it forward. You have to help somebody else apply for a grant. People don't know how to apply for grants. It's a business. It's a talent. It's a skill. And you can fail multiple times, and then you give up. We need people to stay at the table. We need to help them figure out how to do it. And we have the talent inside, and that's something that I think we can do at the region. I think Karen Parrish is, Council Parrish is looking for that team that helps accelerate the process, and I, I think we all want to be part of it. The challenge is how do we move forward? We have the resources inside. We have them at the city. We have them at the region. The money is already in our community. It's a matter of how do you maximize it. Catholic Family Services, to me, is a success story but it took me at least five or six years to help them help themselves. It was hard, it was challenging, and I was on the inside. So I, I think it's, it's, they were success stories, but they almost didn't become a success story. But they had a lot of people on the inside who stayed the course. It's really hard to keep those champions motivated unless something good happens the next time and they've been able to find ways to minimize their expenses by sharing reception, by sharing their costs. That helps them bring more services to the community. But when you know an area like Malton is underserved, you can target those areas to help them help themselves. So I'm happy to help in that regard, but we are breaking new ground. This is different than anything we've done before, and we can't wait for somebody else to help us. We're absolutely equipped to do it ourselves and we can make inroads. I believe in the region and I believe in the staff here in putting those groups together. So I'm happy to support the report, but I agree it has to be something else as well. I, I don't know what that direction is. I'm happy to sit down offline to talk about it, to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Downey. Uh, thank you to you, Chair. Um, just on the heels of that, uh, Catholic Family Services and the Exchange were two community hubs that were um, praised and noted in the provincial um, paper on community hubs. So when I said, you know, we're already we're doing it and we're doing it well, that that's true. Um, they have both been recognized as strong leaders in the community hub industry. Um, and so I think to Councillor Parrish's point, we need a stronger leadership role there. We need to really put ourselves at the front of it. Um, and, and not necessarily look to other jurisdictions when we have winners on our own team. Um, and and we were just shown a beautiful tool, tool about our neighborhoods and where the needs are and where the population is. So to be able to utilize that um, and insert those agencies, the service agencies, into those neighborhoods where they're needed is, is key. To ask um, not-for-profit agencies or service deliverables um, to come back and write uh, business cases you know, these are agencies that we mostly already fund. Um, they don't have the resources to do that. We can do that here. Um, as Mayor Jeffrey pointed out, it, it's something that I think we can do and do it well. So um, I definitely support the report. Um, however, I think that we can do more and do better. So. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Councillor Groves. 
Thank you. And and just a quick question. So we help to establish these community hubs, but how are they funded on an ongoing basis? Because for them to continue, who's funding them? I'm hearing around the table that the province has no money. So um, through the chair, yes, that's correct. The province hasn't really offered up any money. They've offered up a website and some tools. Uh, so that is the issue with community hubs. You can get them started, but it's how do you ensure that they are financially sustainable on a, long, on a longer term basis. So, so how do we do that or who's doing it? So the issue related to the funding that we were proposing today was for organizations who believe that they could develop a community hub to go out and access professional resources, a consultant to help them assess whether the need is there and how they're going to ensure or how they're going to seek that ongoing financial support. Right, so I'll just give you an example. We have a group in Caledon and, um, and the region's working with us and the province is there as well and it's to look at um, providing housing for individuals with uh, disabilities. But So we got some money from the province to go out and retain a consultant to look at how we do this and the type of um, stuff we need to do to make it happen. But we get that from the consultant but there's no money for them to actually implement it. So that's the challenge. We're, and they are all volunteers, and as Councillor Parrish said, they burn out. They burn out. They don't know how to access these things, and that's the problem. We can, it's a great idea, and we can create all of these things, but it's the ongoing sustainability of these groups. So I don't have an answer, and I don't think I heard an answer, but anyway, that would be my, my concern. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Gross. I suspect I might know what the CEO is going to uh, provide, but I'll leave that to after to confirm. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so uh, just to recap, um, staff had recommended that Council approve up um, $150,000 a year to allow community agencies to do planning for hubs. What I'm hearing from Council, and this is really what I'm asking really is for confirmation, is that in addition to have, making that money available for planning, that staff, that the regional staff take an active role in community development related to, uh, well, especially related to hubs and that form of service delivery. That's not a role that we have taken in the past. Uh, it's certainly a role we can take on. Um, I just would like council direction to do so. Okay. Okay. Because it has resource implications, obviously, over time. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask? Thank you, CEO. And I, I, th I suspect that this is where we're going because this type of intervention, the type of resources that is required, um, you know, because there's certainly a capacity issue that becomes uh, quite apparent. Um, I have several who haven't spoken before. I believe Councillor Spoveri, then Councillor Yunika. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, Certainly, um, I, I think we all, all of us, are hearing from our communities that uh, these uh, community hubs are uh, desirable. Um, the uh, I believe that before we really get into spending any any money, uh, we have to have a very clear, defined um, plan as to exactly what these uh, community hubs are, what they will be providing and uh, who's going to provide it and at what cost uh, because uh, I can tell you uh, once we get into this it, it's going to spread. Uh, the, uh, this, this demand will spread region-wide. It's not only going to be just Malton because uh, uh, it's going to, it's going to, there's, going to, there's a big demand for this uh, region-wide and um, so we really need to have a clear plan as to what it's going to, these hubs are going to be pro providing, who's going to be managing, and uh, at what cost, and uh, to what extent are we going to get into this? Because uh, uh, we just can't just do one in one area because uh, we seem to believe that there's a bigger need in one particular area because uh, the, 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 I believe that there's a need right across the region for these type of uh, hubs, uh, but again, we need to know exactly what the purpose will be. 
I know that uh, in uh, Ward 10, we have this amazing uh, new community center called the Gore Meadows, and it has become a, a community hub. And it's, it's become a center where uh, the old, the young, and the middle-aged people, they all, uh, there's something for everyone there to do. There's a library, there's a pool, there's a fitness center, there's children's programs, there's seniors' um, uh, space, and, and it's become a, but it's run by the city. It's a city facility, and it's a great, great example of, um, of a hub, but uh, it's become so popular that people are just uh, thrilled to have this kind of facility in the community. So uh, again, uh, so when, to move forward on this, Mr. Chairman, you know, we need to have a clear plan. It's exactly uh, what, what we're doing and at, at uh, what cost. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Spilberry. I'll pass it to the CEO, please. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, we can certainly do that. We can bring that back. I think we can probably bring it back uh, as part of our budget discussion for Council. I, uh, I'm not hearing Council say go out and develop hubs on every corner. I think what ca I'm hearing Council say is uh, there are many community groups uh, who would be active, could be actively involved in the delivery of service through hubs who don't have the capacity because of, they rely on volunteers often to do the development work and the business planning, the kind of planning that Council Sporvieri talked about themselves. And that we could, we could play a role in facilitating that planning and working with those groups to ensure there is a solid business plan in place uh, and that the need is there. So it's just a more active community development role. Thank you. We'll bring it back. Councillor Unica. Sorry to belabor it, but I'm, I'm somewhat cautious as well. I think the most salient thing around the table was said by Mayor and former Minister Jeffrey, because this thing's a quagmire. There is a lot of entities involved on these files, and the common denominator for all of them is an absence of funding. That's the common denominator. There's no shortage of people that want to do good. It's the absence of funding. And what I'm hearing now is, okay, but why don't we step in? We're the ones that don't have the funds. We're the 10 percent. The provincial federal folks are the ones with all the money. Oh, and look, it's a social service, the business we were never supposed to be in. Local and regional government, hard services, pipes, waters. With a bunch of kids the other day, I say, if you touch it, you feel it, I provide it. That's all I really do. So I provide a sidewalk, I provide a road, I provide a community center, and a 200 other things for which we really don't have the money for. And in this instance, there's dozens of others trying to do it, and I want to step in and fix it. Oh, he really needs a check. So if somebody tells me where the check comes from, I think this is a great idea. The next question becomes, then why didn't those folks just go to the people with the checks? You know, the 90% that the provincial and federal government have. By the way, there are going to be a lot of orphans coming. I don't mean orphans in the literal sense. It's going to be old folks that are going to need stuff. There's going to be middle-aged people that need stuff. There's going to be kids that are graduating with university degrees and can't find homes. I call them the orphans. Open your doors wide. Your 10% will be 20%, which means you're going to double everybody's taxes. The provincial federal government will say, thanks, suckers, and somebody tell me where it's going to end. So I agree entirely with John's comment. Can somebody get a road map and tell me what are we trying to achieve? Who's doing it already? True. How can we assist? And when the question comes to the dollars, if what you're saying is, and we have the answer, we'll just double everybody's taxes. Okay, at least you presented a holistic plan. Because it seems to me the problem is that, do you know how many of these entities I have in Cooksville? We just did the doors open thing in Cooksville. It was a huge success. Mm -hmm. I think I had a dozen groups more Syrian refugees in Cooksville than anywhere else in Canada. I know that because I'm trying to help them on some, uh, some initiatives. There's no shortage of these programs. I don't think the programs are the problem. I just don't think they're all talking to one another, but they're all asking for the same thing, more money. So I, I support, I think, where the CAO is going. Please bring us back a report, and when you get to that bottom line that it's about this amount of money, then we're going to have to have that discussion. But in the years that I've been around, the entities exist, and I think they do a great job. I think they're all knocking on the same door. We really know what to do. Maybe we overlap a bit. Maybe we should streamline some services. But now that we've cleared that up, where's the check? That's what this is about. So 
I don't want to jump into it with great haste until I know, and I think I know where it's going to end up. We know what we want to do. Did you come with a check today? No, then why are you rearranging chairs around here? That is my fear. So I think it warrants the analysis. I, I welcome this conversation. But I fear I know where this is going to end up. It's going to come down to money again. Thank you. Uh, through to the chair. Thank you, Councillor Unica. So, oh, Councillor Parrish. No, well, I don't agree that we provide pipes and pick up garbage. We build social housing. We maintain social housing. We do dental care for seniors. We do all kinds of social services, and that's why we're here. Your argument works down at the city of Mississauga. It doesn't work up here because we spend a large proportion of our budget on social services. And if, if you were listening carefully, all these little organizations in Malton that want to do this are all getting grants already. So they would pool their money, they would cut the rent, they would cut the administration, and it's up to the experts around here to show them how to do it. Not go in and do it for them. Now at some point in a facility like the pool, we may have to put infrastructure in, one time only. And you know I'm pretty good at raising money, so I could probably get it paid for. So let's just cool it here. We're asking now for the staff to come back with a plan that could show us how we could put our staff to its best use out in the community to pull things together and let these groups fund themselves the way they're doing it right now in an organized fashion. Thank you. Sorry, that's not a debate. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Parrish, so you'll move the report. I will. And with direction. Yes. Okay, one more comment, Councillor Groves. Oh, you're seconding. Seconded by Councillor Groves. All in favor? Carrie, thank you very much. Sorry, we have to have a recorded vote on that. Nice oh. try. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Can we do it on here? Okay, so you see the buttons there, recorded vote. Okay, we don't have the technology to display the vote, but it passes, thanks. Okay, great, thank you everyone. And now we go to our next item, 13.3, transition to the new Ontario Early Years Child and Family Centers in Peel. Questions, comments? Councillor Downey. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I'll keep it short because apparently community hubs are way more exciting than we thought. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the earlier centers are a huge, a huge piece to most communities. Um, they offer a vital service. Um, and now the province is handing them back to us, which is great. And they handed them back with $11.8 million. Um, I guess my request to staff is that when you review this, you um, potentially review whether or not that amount is realistic. I know that the province hasn't put any money into early years centers for the last 10 years. And most centers run on a shoestring with um, uh, underpaid staff, um, inadequate facilities, inadequate equipment, all of those things. So my request uh, would be that um, you look at it with uh, the lens that as a region and as we've just discussed in regards to community hubs, potentially we can handle this and do this better. Um, we're a leader in most fields, and I believe that we can be a leader in this field. Um, I think that uh, looking at it um, and trying to make it work with what they've handed us isn't necessarily um, the best approach, and that um, we could potentially look at it with um, a larger investment and um, a larger investment in our community as a whole. So through the chair, thank you very much. I did want to emphasize one of the points that you were making in that there is a lot of transformation that will be required. Uh, we were handed back a system where this funding has basically been static for a decade. There's variability, huge variability in the staff compensa compensation levels, program inconsistencies, um, access inconsistencies. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done to bring the system up to the point of where we'd like to have equal access for parents and high quality programs. Uh, we will take a look at the funding. We've received 11.8. Uh, 
it would require us to prioritize those areas of the greatest need if we were to stay within that 11.8. So we will take a broader look at what we need. Thank you, Councillor Downing. Thank you, Commissioner. Any more comments, questions? No. Report moved by Councillor Councillor Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quickly, um, the Bridgeway uh, Family Service Early Year Center in um, South Mississauga. This past summer, they ran an amazing program down at Jack Dar uh, down at Jack Darling Park, and uh, there were probably about e every Wednesday morning there were probably about two to three hundred uh, people there, families that came from across the GTA. So when you look at service areas in need, I wouldn't think that my area would be highest on that area, but families from uh, Brampton, Oakville, Toronto. In Burlington and uh, within my own area, it came came down to that session every day. So when you look at the programs that are being provided, it's not just within that specific area. It's where they're they're drawing people from. So they do an amazing job for uh, for not only my community but others outside of it as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. So report moved from Councillor by Councillor Downey, seconded by Councillor Pileshi. All in favor? Carried. And I believe last item is a consent. Oh, recorded. Okay. It carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll pass this back over to the chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that brings us to other business. There's a request for uh, to delegate to the October 26, 2017 Regional Council meeting regarding development charges, relief for multiple room areas of worship and directions required. Councillor Sporvieri. Councillor uh, Sporvieri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, um, the, the, the uh, temple that uh, is asking to delegate used to be in Ward 10. Uh, it's now in Ward 8. I believe um, Satvir may have contacted Councillor Miles. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, they like to delegate um, their, um, uh, their the purpose of the delegation is that they're uh, putting a division in their uh, main worship area, and by dividing the they're they're required to pay DCs for this division, so they want to come here and and uh, ask for some. Uh, uh, delegate council to um, get a clarification as to whether uh, dividing a room would uh, why it would require a DC uh, charge when it's still being used as a as a worship area. So I'd like to move that uh, they be um, allowed to come and delegate council at the next meeting. Okay. Can I get a seconder, Second. Councilor Miles? And uh, this will require a recorded vote. Any other speakers? Seeing none. Please make your selection then. Thanks. It carries. Thank you. Uh, moves us to in camera. Oh, Councilor Parrish. Chair Dale, what happened to the questions from Councilor's section? Yeah, that was, did we remove yeah. that? Yeah. Actually, that was uh, the procedure bylaw committee um, recommended that recommended a council to to um, get rid of it. Yeah, and it, and did we vote on that? Yes. Did I vote on that? Yeah, I'd have to look back to see how you voted, but I'm sure you voted. I did not. <laughs> I was going to believe you. Um, then I'd like. Um, Two minutes from my colleagues' uh, permission to um, talk about my Malton police station being removed. Um, I think it's timely because the police budget's coming forward shortly. Can we vote on that? Yes. We'd have to vote to add it, right? Yep. And it's, is that? I'm just getting clarification from the clerk I understand. here. understand. Yeah, we can vote uh, or put a motion to to add it. To I, here. I'll be two minutes. And we need two thirds. And it's a recorded vote. And we need a seconder. Second. Okay, that's seconded by Mayor Crombie. Okay, make your selection.
It carries. It carries. <laughs> that carries. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just want to share with my colleagues that um, one of the three community police stations that are left um, was voted upon by the Police Services Board last week to close down, and that's the one in Malton. And um, the exact letter I got from the chief said it was because of a decrease in productivity, <laughs> less crime, I guess, and the cost associated with keeping the station open. Uh, what I object most to is no one talked to me about it. I talked to Nando, I talked to George, everybody, uh, Councillor Sato, everybody who's had a station closed has had the courtesy of a conversation. Um, what I'm concerned about is the the drop in walk-in traffic is is 22 percent, but it's 1,237 people as opposed to square one, which has 20 times the traffic at 2,864. So that's not a good reason to me. Uh, as soon as the uh, mall manager found out, they offered to cancel all rent, and were shocked that we were doing this. They have put millions into that mall because since the police station's been there, there's no vandalism, there are no gangs, there are no drug sales. The place is cleaned up, so they have made a decision to revamp the whole mall. So it's, it's very devastating. I've been getting letters. The gangs are gone. Uh, parents are calling and saying the school is right beside it. All this mess is going to come back. Um, I was told that the officer was, would be redeployed into the community but the Mississauga News just got a printed memo that said this saves Peel Regional Police $509,770 because they get rid of one um, clerk and they get rid of three police officers. So are they putting them in my community or are they getting rid of them? There's a, a printed memo from a gentleman called Rob Serp, Serpe that says this is saving them half a million dollars. So I would like this reconsidered. I'd like a conversation with the police chief and the police board um, if they're bringing a budget forward in November that has my police, uh, off, my police station out of there, I'm not going to support it. Um, that's a lousy way of saving money. When you have something that's working really well in a high crime area, why do you stop what's working well? I don't get it. And as I say, the, the mall people said instantly, $36,000 a year rent or whatever it is, is gone. They just want utilities covered. So. I'm not happy. Uh, my community is really unhappy. The calls and the emails are rolling in because there's a story in the Mississauga News yesterday. I resent the fact that I would bet you the Police Services Board did not venture out in their cars and go up to Malton and have a look at Westwood Mall and the proximity of the school and the proximity of the park and the Greenway where someone was beaten to death 18 months ago. This is not a pleasant, lovely area where it wasn't and it's getting so much better. It's like buying, I used the analogy yesterday, a nice brand new fridge, put all your stuff in it. Everything's nice and cold, unplug the fridge. You don't need it anymore because everything's nice and cold. This is a disastrous decision. I was not part of it. The mall was not part of it. And it was unanimously arrived at by the police services board without their going out there to actually talk to the people that mattered. So um, I will be asking the police services board through a letter today to sit down with me and have a conversation about this and as i said if this isn't reversed um, i'm going to have a very close look at that budget and see who else has been shafted in the process because uh, five hundred and fifty thousand dollars is not worth the gangs coming back the drugs coming back and everything else that's going to happen there thank you okay thank you madam mayor crombie oh i thought you had um, yeah, just for clarification, Councillor Parrish, I, I do want to, uh, on the record, say that the timing of the, the board's decision was not budget related. I think there was confusion because the budget was dealt with on that day, but it was, it was certainly um, uh, uh, a practice of the, of the police services board, or the police service rather, to um, review once a lease, um, uh, once a lease is expired. To, to review it so but but I think you've taken the appropriate action to refer it to the to the board again um, and appreciate that um, yeah mayor Jeffrey so I appreciate councillor Parrish feels very strongly about this and I can understand 
but I did want to correct as a member of the Police Services Board, it wasn't part of the budget. We did not deal with the budget, to my recollection, that day. We dealt with it at a later meeting, but it wasn't a cost savings issue. And I think the challenge for all board members is we set policy, and we have to rely on the chief to give us uh, advice as to operational uh, activities. This was the chief's advice to the board to uh, not renew the lease. Um, I'm someone who lost a community policing station previously. I know other members have. At the end of the day, um, this is about the chief giving advice to the members about what she would do to deploy her officers. I don't know that this is the right setting to have that conversation specific to your neighborhood. So I thought when we had the conversation that there would be a conversation with you. It was my recommendation that that happen back in September. So I would apologize as a board member that that didn't happen. You should have more notice. You are the local representative and you are the voice and the advocate for your residents. But again, it's not normal to have consultation with local councillors and that's not the way the chief operates, although she tries to use the board as a sounding place and we, our advice was talk with the local councillor. So I would say that it's always a challenge as to operational issues and how involved local board members or board members for Peel react at that place setting. But there are three elected officials at that table who all said you need to talk to the local representative. So obviously there will be more conversations, but again, it was advice from the chief to the board on an operational issue. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I agree with Cal or Mayor Jeffrey. I don't think this is a place to have this conversation. We lost our uh, station and our ward, and I don't remember ever being told that we were losing either. Of course, I was probably just a lonely city councillor at the time, so I didn't get to, to know. But um, the previous police chief told Councillor Moore and I that we had many meetings with him, that our area was the highest concentration of policing in all appeal and yet we lost our station. So if we're gonna have a conversation about an individual station, let's have a conversation about all the stations that we lost and perhaps maybe we need to talk to the chief. And I'm not disagreeing with Councillor Parrish. I think I thought these stations worked. I thought they were very well, but the way it was explained to us afterwards was the, the, the officers that were manning the stations were better used out on the street for, the, for our area. So I don't know, I'm not on police services board, I don't know what happens there, but I trust that the police n know what they're doing. And I'll be honest, we had, we had some backlash too when ours closed down, but that seems to have subsidized the way, or subsidized? Subsided. Subsided away. <laughs> and um, we haven't heard too much lately, but it's still an inconvenience for those people who see what's going on in the streets in our particular area and now don't have a community station to go to. They would rather do that. And what they're being told now is, well, there's one up at Cassie Campbell, so you can go there. That's a long trip for them to go to Cassie Campbell. Personally, I don't see how Cassie Campbell could stay open and ours be closed when we had the highest concentration of policing in all the, re all the region appeals. So uh, now we're going to get counter fleshing into his. But that's just... It's not the conversation we should be having here, and I agree with Mayor Jeffrey on that. Councillor Yannicka. Thank you. Well, um, I, think, I think we're making two different points. From the policy point of view, as someone that's sat on the police board, I understand that. I think the fundamental point the councillor is saying is something this controversial that's going to get a lot of people concerned to have not been approached and been told the what's and the what for's. Uh, Carolyn, you asked and I told you I was approached and we had a fulsome conversation when we lost the one in Cooksville. And, and Councillor Gibson, to your point, and I understood the logic of the other side. Let me kick it around. I think he went back to my ratepayers and we discussed it a little bit further. I think that's what the councillor is saying because where the rubber hits the road, she's suddenly at the Westwood Mall and the people say, what happened? I don't know. Nobody told me. We've just lost the state. You, you can't put their, their frontline person in that, in that situation. So that did not happen to me. I thought it was dealt appropriately. In the end, I think I came to support the decision as well because I understood the rationale. But you haven't given the local councillor the opportunity to do that. And Councillor Parrish, you're right. It won't be the police board that has to explain it. It's yes. you. Yep. 
So, so I think, I understand from the policy perspective, and I was forced to agree with it as well, but you've got to let the local councillor know and be her voice of advocacy or his vote for their community. I think that's where the disconnect came, and I think the, the member has that right, and it was given to me, and I was grateful for it, and I support you in that, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, councillor Sprovieri. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I I got to support the council parish on this one. I I I I understand I understand uh, the situation. Uh, um, I lost one at uh, Mountain Ash Plaza a few years back, and the police did speak to me about it, and uh, they 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 gave me the logic. And uh, you know, I haven't had a complaint from the residents, um, uh, not even one about that being shut down because it, it, it made a lot of sense. It didn't, um, uh, they, there wasn't a big problem in the area. Uh, we don't have the problems you have in Malton and uh, you have a very unique area and I believe that uh, it should be treated uh, uh, uniquely uh, just to, uh, to deal with the problems you have there. So I certainly support your, um, uh, your view on this one and uh, um, so whenever, uh, if, if it comes before us, uh, certainly I believe that uh, it has to be given some special consideration, given the nature of the area, Mr. Chairman. So I support her in this one. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Sato. Thank you. Well, I'm glad Councillor Parrish did raise it at Council, because I think it's important that all members of Council hear her concern, even though it is not a decision that we're making here. Um, I was, I, I also lost a community station and it was actually, it was the first community station that was ever opened and had been a fixture in the community for many years. But uh, the chief did, um, did speak to me ahead of time and, you know, let me know um, why. But I, I think with, uh, with Councillor Parrish's, um, Councillor Carlson will recall, there was a police station planned for Thomas Street near Aaron Mills Parkway. And... We, we were both supporting that that was going to serve our communities. And we were approached this quite some years ago by, by the police, uh, by the chief of the day, saying that they felt that there was a greater need in Malton. And they pointed out all of the statistics and the reason why the police presence in Malton should be increased as opposed to in, in our communities. And we agreed reluctantly at that time that the resources should go to, um, to putting the services in the Malton community instead of at Thomas Street and Aaron Mills Parkway. And we're, we're now building the paramedic center there, so we're still getting a, a service. But it was really hard for us to give that up because I know both of us had been uh, looking forward to, to it. But we realized, too, that it's not the building. It's the, the police that are out on the street. But my, at the time, um, I said, well, then give me a community station. And they did. And it was very, very successful, extremely successful. So I fully understand Councillor Parrish's concern that the station is closing. And, you know, I, I know that this was a decision that the, the board and the police made some time ago to gradually close the stations for various reasons. And there were operational reasons. But... Um, hopefully something like this in an area that had already been determined to need the police presence years ago to the point of building, um, b building the police station there. Um, I, I think Councillor Parrish deserves the, the discussion before a decision is made. And, uh, um, and, I, and I think um, we, we do need to take a look at this when the budget comes forward because we approve the budget. Um, some, of, some of you may recall years ago when, um, not, not the, the current chief, but a very, very former chief, Nando, you'll remember it, um, came to us and we, we were talking about reducing the budget and not approving the budget. And he said, well then, you're going to lose all the programs that you feel that are important. And he turned around and he cut out the community police in the schools program. And it was almost a there. You didn't give me my money, so I'm going to cut your, <laughs> cut your funding. The current chief is not like that. She doesn't do that kind of thing. So I, I, I think a discussion um, 
may change things. I, I don't know. I don't know exactly at what, uh, what the decision of the board was, if it's a done deal or not. But, um, but I think Councillor Parrish should have been consulted, as, as were the rest of us ahead of time. So I'm, I, I do support you in, uh, on your request for that, Carolyn. Thank you. Councillor Carlson. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I went through the same process. Uh, I was called or, or emailed or had a meeting or something maybe two, three months before the, the proposal to close the streets will station, which was, you know, supported by everybody because it was the quietest station in town and, you know, it made a lot of logical sense. But at least I was consulted. But in this case, you have a local councillor that's worked very hard to uh, improve the neighborhood and get the town spirit going, various programs and festivals. <laughs> it's almost a victim of success in that, you know, things are a, a fair bit better, but, you know, just because the train's running good, you don't shut the engine off. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we have a weird relationship with the police services. It's a arm's length and it's paramilitary and we'll ne we can never give input. It's, it's always struck me as a very strange uh, uh, relationship at the, at the region, across Ontario for that matter. So I don't know, it's not appropriate to talk here. You, the police services board, we just heard from the mayor saying, you know, the chief brings forward her recommendation, we vote on it. There is a, a strange rigor to how you approach the uh, police services in Ontario. And I think in the, this age of accountability and transparency where, you know, everybody, you know, is accountable <laughs> to the general public, goodness knows we are, uh, to think that the chief of police doesn't have a semi-political role or can't respond to the needs of a community. Why do we talk about community policing if, you're, if the community is not in that, for, if not being consulted? So I have no problem uh, jostling things a bit and sending a, a directive or a highly <laughs> appropriate suggestion to the chief to uh, come forward with a plan. If this council is uh, receptive to, to continuing the funding, then I would uh, ask, certainly ask the chief to think twice. But in general, I, I don't think we should shy away from on important matters to say, I think we're going a little too far one way or the other. And I'll give you a case in point. When there was a time when the, the cadet program was being threatened to be being removed, I can't remember the exact sequence, but we were asked to think about it and could we continue to fund it. And when it mattered then, oh, please, we need your help. Uh, but now it matters a, a different uh, example. Uh, Certainly, but it's the same idea. So I, I'd like to live in that world where I can just say give orders and, and everybody dutifully votes yes or no. Uh, I don't live in that world and I don't really believe the police chiefs of Ontario. They shouldn't think that they do. Uh, they really do hold a very high office that uh, is at least partially political. And I have no problem with asking the chief to come here or go to the board or whatever. You know, they, they can take, a, they, bring, they send us the bill. So guess what? All right. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Well said. Uh, Mayor Crombie. There he is. Okay. Um, three things. Number one, need in the community. Two, the consultation, which lacked. And thirdly, the savings. You were going to address that. You didn't. So the need in the community exists. We know that it's a high-priority community. There are a few in Mississauga, but it's definitely one of them. We can see the difference that uh, that station has made. Secondly, the consultation. Pat, I was just looking for the email because I did consult with you when the Meadowvale station closed. And when the Meadowvale station closed, that was a different circumstance because the headquarters was moving up the street so they felt it would be redundant. And we talked about that before it happened. So Councillor McFadden and, uh, is our representative and maybe because she was the mayor didn't feel like she could come to you, maybe she thought it was the chief's place, she'll speak for herself, but the chief should have come to you just as she did and I did. Uh, so the consultation lacked. So that has to back up and there should have been that consultation with the local councillor. And finally, the savings, $500 in savings, those five off three officers are going to go back into the force. They'll be absorbed. So there's not $500,000 in savings. There's the lease and the clerk and that's it. And if the lease will be forgiven, then show me where the savings exist. So there's a very strong case here. Keep that station open. Okay, thank you. I think that's the end of my list. Anyone else? No. Um, just. Excuse me. Um, did you, Councillor Parrish, did you want to put a motion forward or no? I would like to 
have a conversation yeah, and I think with the that's chief, appropriate. and uh, I think that's more appropriate than any motion. Yeah. No, okay. I just end the discussion. I think. And 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 in fairness, I, I appreciate that you did raise this here. Um, you know, and, and I think I think uh, not only did Mayor J Jeffrey, but myself and probably others uh, asked the chief to meet with you. Um, why she chose not to meet with you until the board made a decision. And for the record, uh, Mayor Jeffrey, it was dealt with at the last board meeting. We, it was discussed at a previous budget meeting, but it was formally approved at the last board meeting. And, and Mr. Chair, for the record, the police station that George and Pat lost never was built in Malton. They have nothing. Their police station is 21 Division, which is up here right where we are today. It's uh, Queen and... and Dixie, so we didn't get that police station. Thank you. Could I have a motion then to move into camera? Move by Councillor Starr, second by Councillor Raz. All in favor? Carried. Um, I have a motion then moved by Mayor Crombie, seconded by Councillor Moore, that the September 28, 2017 Regional Council closed session report be received, and further that the recommendation contained within the confidential report relating to item 18.2 and related, related bylaw, being bylaw 47 2017, listed on October 12, 2017 Regional Council agenda, be approved and become public upon adoption and further that the recommendation contained within the confidential report relating to item 18.3 listed on the October 12, 2017 Regional Council agenda be received, and further that the recommendations contained within the confidential report relating to items 18.4, 18.6, and 18.7 listed on the, the October 12, 2017 Regional Council agenda be approved and become public upon adoption, and further that the recommendation contained within the confidential report relating to item 18.5 and related bylaw being bylaw 46-2017 listed on the October 12, 2017 Regional Council agenda be approved and become public upon adoption. And this will require a, a um, recorded vote. The motion's carried. Thank you. Uh, bylaw to confirm the proceedings. Yeah. Okay. Um, motion moved by Councillor Kovac, seconded, seconded by Councillor Downey, that bylaw 48 2017 to confirm the proceedings of Regional Council at its meeting held on October 12, 2017, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the Region Appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given the required number of readings taken as read. Signed by the regional chair and the regional clerk, and the corporate seal will be affixed there too. All in favor? Yes. Opposed, if any, carried. Uh, moved by Councillor Pileshi, second by Councillor Parrish. <laughs> uh, the October 12, 2017 Regional Council meeting be adjourned. All in favor? Carried. Lunch is in the back.